Hey, Alex, did we already bring Paul in? We have not. I was going to give it a second. I can see him there. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. Evening, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Want to check in? Good evening. I'm. Hi, hey, Yolanda. I'm stuck in the setting setting sun at the moment, so uh, this odd lighting will pass. It's giving you a nice, nice light cross lighting going on. It's good. It's good. <laughs> a little weird. 
anyways, it'll be, it'll pass pretty soon. All right, I'm gonna go off video. Thanks, everyone. Oh, Kelsey? Yes? We need to pull item 3B5, please. Staff needs to pull that. Oh, okay. Do you want to tell the mayor? Uh, yeah, I'll let him know. Okay. Thanks. Sounds good. Hi, Steve. Good evening, folks. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm hanging right in there, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Um, uh, we only have two minutes, so you can just hang out where you are. I'm happy being here. Thank you. Awesome.
Hey, Steve. I'm muted, so I couldn't hear you. Okay, there's Mr. McClary. Evening. Hey, Bruce. Hey there. Welcome back, Trevor. Hi, Mikey. Hello, all. I understand Karen will not be joining us today. So it's now 6.30. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of August the 22nd, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Council members and the city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so that we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Council Member Pearson? Yes, I am here. Council Member Uri? Here. Mayor Protem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a quorum with Councilmember Fair absent. Councilmember Fair did notify staff that she was homesick and would not be able to attend the meeting. Okay. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the Republic. Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second. A motion and a second to approve the agenda. May we have a roll call vote, Kelsey. I'm sorry, I was muted. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on August 15th, 2022. Terrific. Okay. Uh, okay, that brings we don't have any special announcements so may i have a do we have any written or oral communications from the public yes you have nine speakers signed up the first few are rosemary R. eyed gerard eyed walter zellman uh, georgia goldfarb and joe drummond we'll hear from rosemary first terrific rosemary are you available Rose yes i am Okay, we're ready. Hi, I'm yielding my time to Joe Drummond. Rosemary. Okay, you are, can, we, we do not have a process to, to yield time at this point. And when we did have a process, it was one minute. Uh, your three minutes is yielded for, in exchange for one minute of someone else talking. How many people want to, to give their time to Joe Drummond? Gerhard ID will too. I'm I'm here. Okay, so that's two minutes. How many more minutes do you want to give to Joe Drummond? Anybody else? Bruce? Yeah, I'm not volunteering my minutes, obviously. Um I just yeah, I, I think that there's a um for this 
we've this city council actually over my objection has agreed that we don't yield minutes. So I, I don't think that anybody can yield one minute to someone else unless and until we change that rule. Um, I get what these residents are trying to do. And I agree actually, Paul, with what you're suggesting, which is that it's being done wrong. So I mean, I think you either should just call the yielding out of order or let them do what I know that they probably are attempting to do like they have in the past two weeks. But I don't think we should be going out of our ordinary protocol, even though I think it is should be the protocol and let people yield minutes. Thank so, you so much, Bruce. I'm gonna call the yielding out of order. Rosemary, you can still speak, but you can no longer yield your time. Give us one moment, Mayor, we're asking her to unmute again. Rosemary, if you click the pop-up, we're asking you to unmute and you have three minutes to speak. Yes, I didn't want to speak. I just wanted to yield my time for the video. Is it too late to do that? We've already seen the video twice. Okay, thank you. All right. We'll see if Gerard had something to say on his own. I believe he was on the same account as Rosemary. Yes. Gerard, we're asking you to unmute on Rosemary's account. Same as Rosemary. Gerard. Same as my wife, Rosemary. Okay. Thank you. And our next speaker, I'm looking to see if we have Walt Zellman in the meeting. I'm not seeing him or Georgia Goldfarb. So we'll hear from Joe Drummond next and see if we can circle back. Thank you. Joe, are you available? Hi, yes. I mean, you've all seen the video and Karen Fair is not here. So she keeps avoiding taking responsibility for violating Malibu zoning and building codes of her investment property at 6244 Bush Drive that she purchased, not her daughter, where she lied to city investigators when she brought up the subject of her investment acquisition. Records disprove that and instead show that she was very involved both in ownership and responsible for construction of this property as stated on a permit in her husband's name. At the last city council meeting, she deflected permit violation, which included a stop work order issued from the city and tried to change the subject, alluding that the city somehow acted illegally and not granting her a permit to remodel her incomplete construction to promptly become a two-story house net environmental sensitive habitat. Was that some veiled threat that she was posturing to sue the city for the devious instruction without permit? I shouldn't, she shouldn't try to blame the city when it was her who violated the city codes that ironically she voted for. Perhaps it was the victims she intended those codes to apply and not herself and her investment at 6244 Bush Drive. Over a year ago on July 17, 2021, she misled investigators during her interview when she portrayed ownership as my daughter bought a burnt out property that already had permits in place. That was page seven of her detailed interview by a criminal defense investigator. Apparently this is a smooth move because permitting for that investment of hers was not investigated. And as a council member, she received a copy of this report early, perhaps even as a draft. And if the statement was incorrect, she had every opportunity to correct it either for the report or in public statement. And she did neither. And she didn't because she thought she could keep investigators from finding out the truth about permits and got away with it for a while. She hijacked the last council meeting during the council comment, dragging the building official and assistant planning director on screen to grill them and deflect to expose a code enforcement complainant into the record. She then tried to interview the city attorney and none of it was on the agenda and had to put a stop to it of the obnoxious and improper charade. Now she postures that it was the city that somehow illegally gave her permits. So she obviously feels she's above the law to have tried to get away with it in the first place, convey false information to investigators to distract them from investigating and labeling it politics. So again, we call for the city to reopen the corruption investigation and examine the matter of how and by whom permits were obtained for 6244 Bush Drive and if Esha was acknowledged or, acknowledged or excluded. It is understandable that she's not running for re-election, but it will be very interesting to see if she will endorse or support any candidate this November to replace her. Such would indicate those who think and act the same way as she, who have, made, have benefited or want to benefit from illegal construction. She and her appointed planning commissioner have voted for nearly every development project that comes through. And that's the pro development message that voters will know if she endorses a candidate. Ironic because she ran up for city council that stood by to preserve Malibu's vision and mission statement, yet has ignored and disrespected it, violating Malibu code, not on some small issue, but to construct a second story addition to her investment property. She owes Malibu a big apology for the way she derailed the Joe, building. That's your time. Thanks. 
Our next speaker is Javier Napolis, followed by Hashi Clark, Doug Stewart, and Craig Hill. Hi, Javier. Are you available? Yes, I am. I'm right here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, my name is Javier Napolis. After losing my uh, business to the pandemic, I found myself uh, driving for a popular app, delivering people and driving, uh, driving food and delivering uh driving people and delivering food. Uh, on January 22nd, 2021, I parked outside um, 3203 Colony View Circle uh, to deliver food because I couldn't find the right address. I was approached by a German citizen who happens to be a white supremacist and threatened to kill me with his weapon. I said, which weapon? He said, my AR-15. At that time, the lady, that I was trying to deliver the food showed up and I gave her the food. And at the same time, this guy stood up, um, called 911 on me and told uh, the sheriff's department that if they don't come and remove me, he was going to shoot me. Uh, when the police showed up, he got arrested. I had to identify him and go through the whole process. Um, I was told that I was supposed to be going to court on May. Uh, May came by and nothing, waiting until June and nothing. So I called the DA and the DA says that the case never got to them. So I called the detective who was in charge of the investigation, Detective Spears, and he told me that uh, the DA uh, refused to press charges because uh, the guy didn't really mean it. I've been asking for records of, of the incident and I got nowhere. I went there and asked for the record system and they tell me that there is no record whatsoever of the arrest. All the arrest records have been deleted or erased from the LA County Sheriff's system. And I'm here to ask for help to try to retrieve those records or to, to find out what really happened. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hashi Clark, followed by Doug Stewart and Craig Hill. Hello, Hashi, are you available? I am, but I was here to donate my minute, so I will uh, bow out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Doug Stewart, followed by Craig Hill. Hi, Doug, are you available? I am here. All right. Uh, this is Doug Stewart, uh, Malibu resident. I want to talk to the city council tonight about uh, something that happened on August the 12th. That's when Malibu requested approval from the Coastal Commission for its hosted short-term rental ordinance. I attended that meeting along with several members of the city council, city staff, and other Malibu residents. Besides the rejection of our request, there was clearly a negative tone in what could well be called a dressing down toward Malibu conducted by the chair and several other commission members. Furthermore, the coastal staff presentation was very negative to our proposal from the start. Our hosted STR proposal was probably doomed even before it was called as the next item. There is hope, however, as it was apparent to me that Coastal wants to work out an agreement, as the chair said. We, Coastal, want to help you, Malibu, have a legal solution. We have no idea why you stopped negotiating with our staff. Before we do something rash, let's see if there's a deal here. This is a critical moment for Malibu as STRs are corrupting the residential nature of especially recreational areas, probably the residential nature of especially recreational areas such as Malibu. This was apparent from the comments by three of the commissioners who voiced concerns about what STRs were doing to their areas. Yes, we received their three votes, but it takes five to prevail. As would be imagined, this is a hot topic on social media, especially on next door, where the spin and stories abound about what to do next, who is at fault, and so on. I too joined in, and after being asked what I would do, I prepared the following. I ask that you consider it in your deliberations about what Malibu does for this next step on STRs. Step one, formally and informally reach out to the Coastal Chair and Executive Director to request a restart of the meetings with their staff. Two, propose that our contact team will be senior members from the city. My suggestion would be for two council members, Yurin and Grisani, to afford continuity to the next full council, along with our planning director to be part of that team. Number three, I do what I call a data dump to let them know, if we haven't done it already, how we built the key parts of our hosted ordinance. They obviously have their list of must includes and optional items. Let's find out on a side-by-side -side comparison just how close we are. They likely want a success just as we do. 
This won't be a quick process, as it may take time to digest on both sides and narrow down the issues. We want to keep bringing this back to the council at closed session as quickly and often as possible to keep the discussion between the parties moving and not stall. Keep the public informed, too, to build confidence and progress that's underway. Before the council does anything final, make sure we have at least one or more town hall meetings to let the residents know what's really on the table and also build a consensus and we'll also let Coastal know what we're up against and what we're trying to accomplish. By the end of the day, we have to have Coastal's approval on any STR ordinance. Let's at least start by trying to work with them. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Bill Sampson. Hi, Craig. Are you available? Here I am. Um, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. A um, couple things relating to Caltrans. Last The last eight Sundays, I've had occasion to be traveling east on PCH through central Malibu around noon. And I've noticed a consistent pattern of traffic backing up. It turns out the backup begins at the pedestrian line in front of Malibu Beach Inn. It extends beyond Webway often, and it makes the intersection at Cross Creek even more complicated than it, than it already is. So apparently that button at the end gets pushed too often, and I'm not sure the solution, but it might be good to have Rob Dubow talk to Caltrans to see if the re the button could be regulated so that it only grants a walk sign with with lesser frequency or some somehow fits in better. But that's where the traffic problem is uh, being generated. Secondly, recently we learned that Caltrans proposed to install a pedestrian beacon by Malibu uh, Seafood. That 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 proposal has been dropped. We also just learned that it had been based on exactly and only two pedestrian incidents in the 15 years prior to 2019. That's an incredibly arbitrary criteria to have ordered the so-called improvement, which might explain in part why Caltrans backed away from the public outcry. But two pedestrian incidents in a quarter mile over 15 years is low compared to just about anywhere in Malibu, which made me realize that if Caltrans criteria are that arbitrary, the city shouldn't have trouble persuading them to lower the speed limit to 35 miles per hour in the busy commercial zone between Webway and, say, Tremonto Restaurant, maybe about a mile and a half through there. Uh, our new Lieutenant Carr noted in the August 8th Council meeting that unsafe speed contributes to most collisions. There's been talk about lowering speed limit for years, but apparently the city's 2015 collision study has never been seen by Caltrans, or at least not formally. That study found that, that that commercial stretch to have among the most frequent accidents in the three years from 2012 to 2015 inclusive, there were 105 injury accidents in that stretch alone, one fatality, and we've had several more pedestrian fatalities in the past two years in that area. Comparing the numbers of the two places, incidents in that zone have occurred 270 times more frequently than the stretch at Malibu Seafood. So it's clear that lowering the speed limit to 35 through that busy, complicated stretch of PCH would save lives. So I wonder which one of you has a good rapport with Caltrans and can you get them to swap out a few speed limit signs before next Memorial Day weekend? That would give you nine months to arrange what a, Cal a few Caltrans workers could physically accomplish in a day. Um, finally, a few uh, minutes ago, I spoke uh, about county libraries and how they have tool lending libraries and how that concept could be adapted and sort of enriched for Malibu. Uh, I thought that Jay Wagner might be talking more about um, libraries today, but that he has a video, but uh, I don't know if he'll be able to show it because of the uh, time donation limitations. Craig, but that's your time. He, he should, you should see the video. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is Bill Sampson. Mr. Sampson, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, a few weeks ago, I mentioned a lobbyist who was unregistered, and I wanted to thank Trevor for at least responding to my concerns. His conclusion was that no registration is required. I disagree, but I appreciate him taking the time. and it, It's not something I'm planning on pursuing uh, at the moment. Uh, next, I do have a... Um, I, I, I sent a letter to the Malibu Times um, and Haley Matson did respond saying she was going to look at the video of the Coastal Commission uh, meeting that Mr. Stewart referenced. He and I obviously watched the uh, different meetings. Uh, he put a spin on it, his term. I don't use that. I will retract that term. It doesn't mean spin, and I know what you meant. 
So I, he viewed it differently than I. I'll leave it at that. I just wonder where he's been the last seven years. However, the Malibu Times reported, and I think absolutely unintentionally, I am sure, the reporter confused two different items on the agenda, item four, which was a local government workshop, and item 10, which was, in fact, our the submission of our uh, hosted ordinance. Uh, I was never happy with that ordinance. I was especially unhappy with misrepresentations, in my opinion, that the council made to justify its passage at the time. Um, however, the Times reported somehow confused the two of them, I think, again, unintentionally, but it said that Mr. Grassani spoke on item 10 as a representative of Malibu. On item four, he, rep he did say, I'm the mayor, and said he's speaking as a private citizen, he in fact, spoke on behalf of a, a group of uh, real estate professionals as they characterize themselves. It does not appear there's anybody in it other than um, real, realtors, but I could be corrected on that. I'm not a member and don't intend to be. On item 10, Mr. Grassani did not speak at all. No one, no one on the council spoke on behalf of the city. Mr. Silverstein did speak as a private citizen. And the chair was obviously unhappy with us, as were some of the other commissioners, some weren't. Um, I found the attitude expressed by staff, starting with the first emails upon submission, shortly after passage of the uh, short-term rental ordinance, to be particularly disdainful. Those early emails were of the, you were a bunch of rich people, and you don't care about the public and you just are absolute elitists. That attitude carried through in staff's report all the way along. Uh, I commend the council, including the members now for taking a swing at defending an ordinance I didn't even like in which contained misrepresentations in the recitals, but we saw different meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Who do we have next? Well, Mayor, we're trying to circle back to the people we missed earlier. I still don't see Georgia Goldfarb or Walter Zellman, but I know Walter's been emailing staff to say he's here. So, Walter, if you're in the Zoom meeting, please raise your hand. We don't see you under that name or any similar names. So, Walter or Georgia, if you're in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your hand at the bottom of your screen. And Mayor, not seeing a raised hand from uh, Walter, Georgia, or anyone else, that would conclude public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, that takes us to item number 2B, which is commission, committee, and city manager updates. Do we have any commission or committee updates? No, you don't have any commission or committee updates. Okay. Mr. McClary, would you be kind enough to give us a report? <clears throat> Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, before I give a report, I was asked to read a brief statement from council member Farrer regarding her absence this evening. Uh, let me go ahead and read that for you. So this is again, a statement from council member Karen Farrer. Unfortunately, I tested positive for COVID-19 on August 17th and have been isolating and recovering at home. I am grateful that I have been double vaccinated and boosted against COVID-19 which I believe kept me from getting more severely ill or worse. My message for the community is this, COVID-19 is not over. It is still highly contagious and you can catch it and get sick, even if you are vaccinated. I urge everyone to continue to be careful and take precautions to protect themselves and their loved ones. I am recovering, but unfortunately due to the lingering symptoms, I'm not able to participate in tonight's city council meeting. Again, that was a statement from council member Karen Fair. Uh, on to my report. Um, ironically, I will talk, give an update on what's happening with COVID-19. Um, we are seeing a, a decline in cases and a leveling off in hospital admissions. Uh, right now, uh, as of August 12th, the county had reported just under 4,000 new cases and there are 1,065 cases in hospitals. Uh, the seven-day positivity rate at that point was 11.1%. The county also reported 19 new deaths at that time and reported that we've uh, moved from the high 
uh, community transmission level to the medium community transmission level. Um, they are still encouraging persons to get vaccinated. Uh, they're stating that the unvaccinated are twice more likely to get infected, twice more likely to be hospitalized, and more than five times more likely to die. Uh, also, and just wanted to pass on that they are no longer recommending the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, that's it for my COVID report. Uh, I've heard several speakers already give um, some updates on what happened with Coastal Commission, so I'll try to keep that brief. Uh, again, uh, as you were probably well aware, the commission did not approve on August 12th uh, the city's amendment uh, to its to request to have a hosted short-term rental ordinance. Uh, the commission did encourage the city to uh, work with coastal staff uh, should the city want to come back and pursue any other amendments or modifications. City staff will be preparing uh, to return to city council with an item in the near future for discussion and direction. And also mentioned um, that morning, there was the workshop on the sea level rise and uh, several staff from the city did attend that. Uh, we heard from several cities who had gone through uh, the process of amending their coastal plan uh, through the Coastal Commission. And I think the key, key takeaways that we got from that workshop was that uh, it's really important to start working on that amendment process as soon as possible. Uh, and to coordinate as much as you can uh, with the coastal staff throughout that. Uh, and also, I think probably more importantly, uh, engagement with the community uh, is going to be very critical. And as you know, for uh, Malibu, we have a large number of private, private property owners uh, who are along the coast who are potentially would be affected by this. Uh, so I think outreach and coordination are going to be very much key as the city moves forward in that process. And just an update on where we are at with that. Um, just a reminder, it was back in 2019 that the city entered into an agreement with Environmental Science Associates. Uh, they have prepared a coastal vulnerability assessment that is evaluating the susceptibility of the local coastline to potential adverse effects of climate change, including beach erosion. That report has been completed and is currently being reviewed by our coastal engineering staff. Uh, and we will be bringing that forward to council soon with the idea of doing public outreach uh, for a spring of next year. I uh, wanted to give a report on where we're at again with the, um, the day use impound lot. Uh, we had four vehicles towed the weekend of August 13th, 14th, 17 towed this past weekend. That brings the total to date since the operation began of 215 vehicles that were towed to the site. Uh, to date, there have been 19 vehicles that were unclaimed at the end of the day, and those were all towed to the uh, tow yard facility in Thousand Oaks. No vehicles have been left overnight at the Heathercliff lot facility, and we have not had any reports of any significant issues or incidents to date. Happy to report that we have filled several vacant positions recently, including accountant clerk, deputy city clerk, permit services technician, uh, two engineering positions in public works, and also an environmental sustainability analyst. So happy to report that we are getting a little fuller in city hall these days. I uh, wanted to thank everybody who participated in the distribution of the NOAA weather radios on Thursday at City Hall. Uh, I don't have any numbers on how many were just distributed out, uh, but looked like we had a very good turnout at the day. So uh, thank you to everybody who was part of that. Also wanted to report a um, couple of Reports, sorry, here's needed to pull this up. I got too many things to read from today. Um, also wanted to report that in terms of our uh, dark skies, uh, Malibu dark skies, we have um, 
There's going to be an educational presentation for residents and businesses. That's going to be August 30th and 31st. Those are both virtual educational presentations to help uh, persons comply with the city's dark sky requirements. The deadline is October 15th. Um, the training uh, or outreach for residential properties is going to be Tuesday, August 30th at 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And for commercial and multifamily properties will be August 31st, excuse me, yeah, uh, yeah, Wednesday, August 31st from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Also wanted to report that um, we have recently uh, put out a, a new process for um, express plan reviews for uh, tenant improvements. Um, so there's information on that in the city manager's weekly update. Uh, that's gonna be for low impact tenant improvements. Uh, and so we've come up with a process to hopefully speed those along. Also wanted to note that um, the nomination period has closed for the election. Uh, we will have uh, six persons have qualified uh, for the two seats on city council. Um, also, as you are probably aware, the city has placed a measure on the fall ballot. Uh, this is the city's transition transaction and use tax measure uh, that has will appear on the ballot as measure MC. So you can thank Malibu City for that. Um, that is it for my. Oh, sorry. There's one other thing I want to report on. Sorry. Um, I reported previously at the last city council meeting that there had been an outage in the West Malibu area. This was on August 6th. Uh, I had reported that it was due to a third party vendor that had, uh, had been doing some tree trimming. I did check with Andrew Thomas, our representative from Southern California Edison, and he did confirm that that was a third party uh, that did, was not under contract um, working for Edison or doing any work at the behest of Edison. Uh, it was somebody else working independently who had unfortunately um, affected that line. That is it for my report, uh, and I'd be happy to um, turn it over to Lieutenant Carr or Captain C2 for the report from the Sheriff's Department. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Is Lieutenant Carr available or Captain I C2? I am, thank you. Lieutenant Carr, please. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, Mayor Gazanti, members of the council and members of the public. Uh, I will, uh, let's see here. There we go. I'll, uh, I'm here to uh, present my mid-month report. Um, I'll start with uh, quality of life issues. Uh, I personally went down and looked to uh, make sure the parking issue on Civic Center Drive was resolved. It appears the remaining cars are associated with the construction going on at the Santa Monica College area. Um, I also met with one of the public safety commissioners regarding the motorhomes on PCH. Uh, several uh, areas of concern were identified, and we will be acting on enforcement uh, regarding those issues. Uh, insofar as that's concerned, uh, the uh, deputies are excited about getting the electronic parking site devices, and we look forward to using those and implementing those as soon as they're available. Uh, uh, on two nights so far this month, we have done some enforcement regarding the speeders on Pacific Coast Highway. So far, uh, no organized speed competitions have been found. We will continue to do aggressive enforcement uh, to ensure that uh, this continues. I urge members of the public, if you notice speeding on PCH, to please call the Sheriff's Department uh, so uh, we can continue enforcement in that manner. So far, mid-month, month over month, we've seen no significant increase in crime, and we are on track, uh, and hopefully this continues to be uh, significantly less traffic collisions than we were last month. I will give a full traffic report ne on next month's report when August numbers are available. And let's see here. Lastly, I would like to introduce uh, Sergeant Bill Velick. Sergeant Velik has been uh, running the uh, summer beach team uh, during this year, but he is now transitioning uh, once the beach team ends to our school safety sergeant. We all attended the first day of school, and Sergeant Velik, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the city council, members of the public, uh, they look forward to to meeting you and uh, and learning about the services that that you'll be providing. Sergeant Velik. Oh. 
I apologize. He might be having some te technical difficulties. He was on, but we do have a sergeant assigned to the schools uh, from Malibu Lost Hill Station, and uh, as well as a uh, as a team of deputies. Uh, they will be they they will be inter they will be available to the schools uh, for safety counseling and support. And that is my report uh, for the mid month of August. Thank you, Lieutenant Carr. Is Captain C2 available? Does she have anything she wants to tell us? I believe uh, Captain C2 had a different meeting tonight. She will not be on tonight. Here's somebody. No? I'm sorry, okay. who are you looking for, Mayor? Captain C2, is she available? No, we don't have her in the meeting. Okay. That's all right. Okay. I believe that I want to thank you, uh, Lieutenant Carr, and uh, thank you for what you're doing. And I was kind of uh, interested in the fact that we have up until two weeks, at two weeks ago, we hadn't had any unclaimed cars in the tow yard at the end of the day. In the last two weeks, we've apparently had 19. Do you have anything you could uh any information you can give us about why that might be? Um, you know, it might be an education issue uh, in, insofar as that's concerned. Uh, they may not know where to go to pick up their cars. I will certainly look into that and I will, um, and I will certainly get back to you regarding that and uh, okay. see if we can't get that resolved in a timely manner. Okay, thank you. All right. Do we have any city council? Oh, Bruce, followed by Steve. Yeah, actually, just a question um, to follow up on your question, Paul. The, the 19 unclaimed cars, what happened to them? You know, this is actually- They the would have been, been towed to- I'm sorry, sir. No, they, they get towed to the headquarters of the tow company, which I think is in Newberry Park. Is that correct, Newberry Park? Or is Thousand Oaks? Mr. Mayor, the, the report that I received from our public safety staff said, said Thousand Oaks. Um, I mean, sometimes okay. Thousand Oaks, Newbury Park, somewhat uh, same area. Um, so and right. I do want to make one statement. Um, you know, in the previous reports that I've been given, I was not aware. I had not been given any information on, in, on the number of vehicles that had um, not been picked up at the end of the day. Um, so when, we, when I got that number and reported that today, uh, that was a cumulative number that unfortunately I did not have before, uh, or I would have been reporting that cumulatively to the council. Um, so I, I don't have that broken down to date, uh, but I'd happy be happy to get the, that breakdown and forward that to the council. So Steve, that's, that's 19 over the course of the summer since that tow yard was instituted? That's my understanding, correct, Councilman. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uring. Can't hear you. You're muted. I thought we were going to go to council member comments, so I'll hold off to you. We're getting ready to go there. I think we're ready to go to council comments, unless you want to give a subcommittee report. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, a couple things. One, I want to congratulate the six members of the residents who signed up to run for city council why you decided to do that, I have no idea, but I wish you the very best as you go through whatever election process you're gonna go through. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, I attended a Santa Monica Bay Restoration Committee meeting, and I continue to be really impressed with the quality of work these folks are doing. Um, give you, and I'm not, you know, it's a, they're two or three hour meetings, some, but you know, they're restoring kelp beds off Palos Verdes. Uh, and what we've learned is these kelp beds reduce the wave activity uh, or the energy of the waves, reducing coastal erosion. And the other thing we've learned is kelp beds do better when they've got abalone with them. So in addition to restoring the kelp beds, they're restoring the abalone population out there. Uh, and it's just, you know, it seems like we're getting smarter in terms of what's going on and they're doing a better job of trying to protect that. The uh, Restoration Commission has also been working on um, processes to re to for water restoration and reclamation. Uh, you know, there's a, water is gonna be our big issue. 
And anytime there's a storm, we lose a whole bunch of water going into the ocean in these ocean outfalls. So there are a number of projects going on to figure out ways to sort of recapture some of that water and, and make it usable. Matter of fact, there was a EIR report I got today from Tapia, or, or, or Las Virginies, uh, they're starting a water reclamation project. They got an EIR out there they want people to take a look at, so I encourage you to do that. Um, the, the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission is requesting a grant uh, with some of these infrastructure funds, and part of that grant money is going to be used to help us prevent some of the erosion taking place at the Adamson House. Uh, so that I think that's a you know I I think they're asking for almost seven hundred fifty or eight hundred thousand dollars to help them do that. And I think that's a very good process. And then finally, what they're doing off the coast of Palos Verdes, apparently there used to be a bunch of rock reefs out there. That over time, as there have been landslides off Palos Verdes, those rock reefs have got covered with mud and it just sort of disappeared. So there's been a project going on to try and restore some of those reefs, and they put one out there. Uh, about 18 months ago, and after 18 months, they expected this thing was going to take a couple of years to really become viable and, and working. After 18 months, if you take it, they, they got some videos uh, from under the water. It looks like you're walking through a forest with fish in there. So it's become, after 18 months, they've got a whole bunch of uh, restoration process taking place much more quickly than they thought. So it, 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 was, it was very, very interesting. And so I, I mean, I leave the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission meetings feeling very good, uh, recognizing that there's some people out there that are really working to try and protect and save our environment for future generations. And I think that's what we should be doing. So, I, 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 you know, if, if anybody has more, if, wants to get more information on that, their meetings are online. It's a very interesting group and a very group, a lot of smart people in that thing. Uh, dark sky. Uh, I got an email from Yolanda today that the dark sky flyers are getting ready to mail out. And I want to thank, uh, they were designed by Don Navarro. Uh, and I want to thank her very much for the work that she's done. And I want to congratulate Don, Tammy Winnikoff, uh, Jim Benya, and Yolanda Bundy and the Malibu uh, General Fund Grant Program, which gave us the money we needed to print those flyers. Uh, you know, this has been a long flog, uh, you know, rowing that boat through some rocky waters. We've been doing that for a number of years. These people have put their backs to it, and they're really helping us move forward with this Dark Sky program. So I congratulate them very much. And Trevor, if you would sign the uh, general fund grant to get them the money to pay for the flyers that they printed, I would appreciate that. They're waiting for that to come through. Okay. Uh, about a month, month and a half ago, I got a call from a young lady who was a freshman at Pepperdine, Kayla Nye, uh, and she is a political science major there. And she apparently got into Pepperdine and decided she wanted to try and do some stuff for the city of Malibu and learn a little bit more about our uh, process here. So she, I guess, apparently did some work looking at some of the city council meetings and decided that some, you know, some of the city council people needed some help. And I guess she picked me as the person they needed the most. So she gave me a call, which I, <laughs> I, I demonstrate how smart she is. Uh, so she gave me a call and we, so we talked. And one of the things we, we found an agreement on is trying to understand a little bit more about the safety at our schools. That was an, an item she was interested in as well as I was. So she has been out doing some surveys, talking to teachers and parents about what they, they are concerned with, with safety some ideas they may have of what they would like to see happen there. And she will, she's almost through with that. Once she gets done, she'll put together a little report, which will get to everybody, whether it goes to this, you know, the, the subcommittee doing safety or the, the community as a whole, we'll figure that out. But a couple of things that have come up. One is a lot of the teachers have suggested that what they'd like to see is some kind of a, of a security button in the classrooms. Something that if there's an, an emergency, the teachers could push that, and that would signal the sheriff to come in and take care of that, you know, do something. So I don't know where, if you guys on the, the uh, subcommittee, uh, I don't know if you've heard about that or thought about that, but that is something we've heard repeatedly from some of the teachers. So maybe something you want to put on your uh, radar screen to take a look at. I think that's a good idea. I'm not sure exactly how it all works, but it may help uh, provide some level of security for or, and safety for the students. 
And the second thing we've learned is that a lot of the parents don't have any idea of exactly what we're doing at the school right now. I mean, I got a, I got a bunch of emails on, I guess the, the sheriff had a fairly large presence at opening day at Malibu High, and I, I got two re responses. One, some parents said they were happy to see that happen. Uh, other parents were said they were sad to see that that's what we have to do today to take care of our, res our students. Uh, so I'm not sure where it should come from, from the city, from the school, from the sheriff, but if somebody could give a little report in terms of what steps we're taking currently to protect the, the, you know, the safety of the school. We've got this resource officer. What is this resource officer going to do? How is it going to interact with the residents? I think the parents who are dealing with students at Malibu High School would love to hear that. Uh, okay, the last one is, I also listened to the Coastal Commission meeting that took place on August 12th. And my mother always told me, if you can't say something nice about somebody, you should not say anything at all. So I'm going to follow her guidance, and Paul, turn it back to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, who would like to go next? Mikey. Thank you, Paul. Um, just a few things here. Uh, Craig, you talked about the traffic backup. I, unless I misheard you, I thought you said there was very low incidence of accidents at the Costa Beach Club. Did I get the location wrong? Um, I, I just I just don't think that's right in my memory, but maybe I'm wrong. Certainly, if that's true, the ones that have happened are so horrible, they, they extend beyond the number. So I'm, I'm not sure on that one. That doesn't quite sound right, but hopefully I'm wrong. Um, uh, Mr. McClary, um, Thanks for your report. Great to hear about that many filled positions. I know that's a lot of new people to sort of integrate all at once. And uh, but still, um, in an environment where it's hard to find qualified help, that sounds like you've done a really good job. And I want to thank you for that. That was uh, surprised how many positions were filled there. So well done there. And um, I did think the sea level rise. Um, workshop at the Coastal Commission meeting was interesting. I think the problem has been for cities like us that it's so difficult and expensive to do. And by the time you're done, you have to start all over again on some of your studies. So, and I know the Coastal Commission is aware of this and the part they play in it. So um, I'm going to try and be positive that that is heading in a way that makes more sense, especially for smaller cities like us. Um, Great to hear, uh, Lieutenant Carr, about um, the focus on schools. It's just thanks for saying it in public. Um, we appreciate that. And yes, I know it's always a two-edged sword. We wish it wasn't so, um, but there we are. I also uh, was at the city, uh, the Coastal Commission meeting. Actually, I was online for the workshop and showed up in time for our item in person. Um, I'll, I'll say my comments, this, this will be something we'll be discussing as a council, but I was surprised we got three votes. <laughs> so uh, that was the main reason I thought we should deny the hearing. I said it before. I denied um, just working with staff after getting a letter from staff is I wanted to hear from the Coastal Commissioners. And I thought that ended up with huge value for us because we got a much better understanding of what they were thinking than we could ever get from a letter from staff. So um, I, I think in many ways, frustrations on both sides, that to me was a, an important moment. And I, I appreciate that. Um, other than that, I'm involved in a number of fire prep um, meetings, um, including one with Gabe and, um, and the person that works with him, whose name has just left my head. But um, it's good to see a lot of people are taking fire prep very seriously. Um, I think it's just, to me, continues to be very obvious that we're running out of, we will agencies will continue to improve in their response, but we're running out of the impact that's going to have at some point. And the last line of defense is, is people have to harden their home. We are not going to stop fire. 
um, we are going to have to harden our homes. So I hope people are getting that message. Please have a home assessment done, a home hardening assessment. They are free. The city's doing them. Doesn't put you under any legal obligation. Uh, my personal hope and opinion is at some point that's related to the insurance premiums or even availability that you have living in a in a high severity fire zone. Um, lastly, just listening on the COVID talk, I am just around me am seeing a fair amount of COVID right now. It's um, notable, notable to the and it's notable to me. Very often when I walk into a market, I'm close to one of the only people wearing a mask. So personal choice. I don't want to get my in-laws sick. I don't want to get sick personally, but um, number of people I know have COVID right now. So it's, it's around. And uh, with that, I'm done. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce. Okay, thanks, Paul. So first of all, um, Karen, if you're watching or if you watch recruiting, wish, wish you well. Um, I, I applaud that message. It was very well stated and I agree with what you said. Um, and, you know, I, I was at a market the other day in, in Malibu and the cashier when I went up was wearing a mask, as was I, and we were a minority in the market. And I, I asked her um, whether it was concerning to her that she had to um, be there and people were coming without masks routinely dealing with her. And she was a little disturbed. She said she understood the pe people's choice though. But you know, the thing she said to me that was really amazing was she says, people without masks complain about the fact that she's wearing one. I don't know what this world's coming to when, when somebody's personal choice to wear some, something to take care of themselves is being criticized by other people who care not to. That doesn't make any sense to me. You know. By, by all means, if you, if you want to exercise your freedom, exercise your freedom, but recognize the right of others to do the same. Um, Mikey, I agree with you I, from the, about the Coastal Commission meeting. I, I thought it was very valuable to hear from the three commissioners who spoke in favor of our um, pr proposal. And I, I got to speak to um, two of them afterwards, and that was, that was helpful as well. It was interesting to me, all three of them um, indicated they had had, indicated, they stated they'd had ex parte communications with union representatives who also were there to support our proposal. And I've been told that they rarely have those communications so much so that I, I, I had one time tried to have some with a few of them about another matter and had given up on the understanding that they don't do it. But so that was, that was also important to learn. But I, you know, I agree hundred percent with what you said. And I, I said the same thing to the few that I spoke with, which is we're being told work with the commission, try to try to get a deal with the commission but we don't know what the commission wants. We only know what their staffers tell us. And I respect that their staffers sit through all their meetings, hear what their, what their countervailing views are and, um, and have some indication. But you know, our staff doesn't know what's in our heads any more than their staff at the end of the day knows what's in their head. Um, and as evidenced by the fact that three of them at least disagreed with their staff. So I, I think that's a very um, unacceptable response that we were given. Um, I'll also say I noticed it was, I don't know if the show on the recording of anybody wa was watching on video, but uh, Bill Sampson spoke by video. He, he, he zoomed in. The entire time he, he did that, the chair and the co-chair were sitting and laughing to each other, talking with papers in front of their faces. And to me, that was just the utmost disrespect. I don't know that it's even lawful. I don't, you know, we're, we're, we're told at the beginning of our um, terms, don't speak to each other during meetings. Um, it's a private meeting during a public meeting, but it was going on. So I guess they're all powerful. They can do whatever they want. Uh, sorry, some of the the people that spoke today, Mr. Napolis, if I, if I pronounced your name, if I mispronounced it, I apologize. Um, you know, that sounds like a serious situation you were in. Unfortunately, I think we're, I don't think we're the, I don't think, I know we're not the people to be dealing with that kind of a situation, but we appreciate your bringing it to our attention. I think the ACLU or um, some other private defender type um, situation you might want to reach out to because there's, you can speak publicly here, but there's really nothing that we can do about a situation like that. that. Um, Doug Stewart, um, you know, Bill, Bill Sampson said, where have you been for the last seven years? I agree. It's interesting that you all of a sudden have a keen interest in the short-term rental um, statute or ordinance, but you know, 
I agree, I wanna work out a solution too. But again, the problem is we don't have access to the people with whom we need to work out that solution. And I wanna explain, because I've gotten guff from this and so have other members of the council, the reason for my decision to support not negotiating with the, with the staff. And you know, we had a multi-year process where the public weighed in on what was ultimately approved by the city council. And that was the city council before my watch. I actually disagreed with what ultimately was approved. But we had a multi-year process. We heard from the public. The public was in complete disagreement on what made sense. And that proposal was a huge compromise. And to me, it is a complete disservice in pulling the wool out, the rug out from underneath our residents. If after reaching a public compromise like we did, all of a sudden, because some staffers on the Coastal Commission have a problem with it, we were to privately then go to negotiate a further compromise, because that would make the compromise that was already struck among the residents ineffective. Uh, you know, if we weren't under Brown Act type constraints and, and we're dealing privately, the way you would deal with something like that is you would actually propose less than what you think you're going to get. You, you propose more than you expect to get, and then you negotiate down to what you actually had agreed on. But it's all public. We have to do it publicly. So we did it honestly. We did it publicly. And we'll have to start over now. Uh, and we and we do have more information. I have a lot more I'll say about that when, when that comes before us in a formal way, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a purveyor of misinformation in the city that, that does his best to make sure of that. Um, Craig, I think Craig talked about the Malibu seafood, seafood area, not, not La Costa, but I, I could be mistaken myself. I think that's what he was saying. Um, lowering the speed limit would be great. We had a meeting about that few weeks ago, it requires a lot more process, unfortunately, than Caltrans just deciding to do it. Um, oh, and this, this ties into the, the, the uh, sheriff's report. I'm glad to hear, I'm encouraged to hear that there's attention being given to the vehicles that are parked on the roads at night. Um, and I think there's a misplaced overemphasis on the oversized vehicle ordinance and the no parking restrictions. Um, we have a camping ordinance. We, we, we went to a great deal of trouble to craft that in a way that we understood would be um, viable. And we worked with the Sheriff's Department with then Captain Becerra and um, Lieutenant Braden to make sure that once we, we adopted it, it would be enforced by the Sheriff's Department. And we're told it would be. It is a violation of that ordinance to be sleeping in a vehicle on the side of PCH. I, I don't mean take a five minute nap, but sleeping overnight in vehicles, that's camping. So we don't need the oversized vehicle ordinance. We don't need the no parking ordinances. Those are all great. They're belt, they're, they're, these are all belt and suspenders, but I, I wish somebody would finally focus on the fact that you're not allowed to camp on the highway in Malibu or anywhere in Malibu for that matter, other than at a lawful campsite. Um, I think the public needs to understand this time contribution issue because it, it's come up a multiple times tonight. It comes up other times. I know what the residents tonight were trying to do. I'm actually glad we didn't see that recording for a third week, third meeting in a row. But you can you can use your three minutes to play a recording if you wish to. That's your three minutes. You also can choose to speak however what you want to speak for three minutes. What you can't do is seed your time to someone else unless and until we change the process, which I wish we would do. But so when people want to play a part of a recording on, that someone else has that's longer than three minutes, what they need to do is say, I'd like to play this recording. The clerk will stop it after three minutes. And then if someone else follows and asks for the same thing, that's how it works. Uh, it's a game that we don't let you have extra time. It's a game that you take it that way. Either way, you got to follow the rule, play the game right. Um, Bill Sampson, again, no, you, were, you were correct when you said no council person spoke qua council person at the hearing, uh, you know, and that's because council people aren't supposed to speak on behalf of the city unless the council has authorized them to do so and the council hadn't delegated or authorized, designated or authorized anyone to speak for the city on, that, on behalf on that, on that matter. So that's why it wasn't out of a lack of desire. Um, I just have a couple more loose comments here. Oh, Doug mentioned we need to have a bunch of closed sessions to constantly work on how we're going to deal with that. Uh, Doug, if you get elected, you'll learn about the Brown Act. Um, I would hope you learned about it in all these years that you seem to be, oh, you're on a commission. You want to know about it. You can't have closed session meetings to discuss ordinances that you want to adopt. You've got to do that publicly. It's just the way it works. Um, 
Last thing, oh, Steve, thank you for bringing up the panic button idea, you know, because we can't talk because of the Brown Act, because I'm on that subcommittee with, with Paul, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. I, I've gotten a number of emails, I think we all have about a locked gun ordinance um, that some other jurisdictions have adopted. Um, I don't know all the details of the pros and cons. It sounds like it's a good idea without any cons, um, but I'm sure I'll hear from some Second Amendment people that'll tell me otherwise. Uh, but maybe that's something we ought to be thinking about as well, at least put it on the agenda to, to consider. Uh, lastly, you know, six people running for two seats. Last election, we had eight people running for three seats. Um, it's a very strange system. It results in very strange results that wouldn't necessarily be the case if we had two or three people running for two or three. Well, obviously, not two or three. if people were running against each other for a specific, specific seat, I don't know how you do it, but maybe we need to have a conversation going forward at some point about election reform in Malibu so that there aren't ways to game the system when running for election, because it really ought to be a merits-based decision um, where each person's running in their own. I'm, I'm rambling, but there's something wrong with the way we do our elections, because what can actually happen is multiple people who get a second and third vote from someone who wants someone else as their first choice, really, end up getting elected over the first choices because of the math, and it's it's very weird. So um, those are my rambling comments for tonight. I, I'm betting we're going to be done by 10 tonight. We'll see if I get that right. You, from your lips to God's ears, Bruce. Uh, I just want to. that important. Well, you can never tell who's listening, Bruce. Uh, I'm, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I did uh, in the week before the uh, coastal hearing. I was in one of the people that was invited to Charles Lester's uh, sessions on sea level rise, and those are. Charles Lester is a former uh, Coastal Commission uh, administrator who is now running a think tank in Santa Barbara. And apparently he's had several uh, meetings with people from different cities and people from different science areas and things like that. And I was invited to one that was held uh, last Monday or uh, the Monday before that rather. And it was uh, it was very interesting. Uh, he displayed a a real interest in what people find uh, useful and what we find uh, not useful. He expressed a lot of interest in things like the reef that Steve Uring was talking about. He expressed a lot of interest in the uh, in bringing back the kelp. We've had uh, kelp farmed off coast here and uh, you know I've been here for many years where the kelp was uh, was very thick at the surface and that seems to have gone away and that needs to come back and I, I look forward to that but I, I, I had real hope for him giving some good advice to the Coastal Commission as to our Coastal Commission meeting when the Coastal Commissioners were talking I thought we had a good chance of it being a four to four vote and the chair worked very hard to turn one of those people into a no vote so that we would lose on a five to three. And uh, I was mystified by the chair's attitude, but you know, it, it uh, didn't make a lot of sense to me. And as far, I know that members of staff approached uh, the director and the and the assistant director about having a meeting about this and other issues directly, and I'm looking forward to hearing something positive about that at some point soon. Uh, and that's about it for the moment. Uh, so let's go on and talk about the consent calendar. I have been uh, told that staff that city manager wants to pull item 3B5. So have the members of the public pulled any, asked to pull any items from the agenda? No, nothing has been pulled by the public. Nothing pulled. Do any members of the commit, the council wish to pull anything from the consent calendar? I see no hands, okay. So let's go ahead and, pass everything but 3B5, oh wait, 
Move to approve. We didn't go 3A1. Uh, Mayor, I'm, 3A1 yeah. can be approved with the rest of the consent calendar if you'd like. Okay, very good. Does anybody have any objections to that? So what we're looking for then is a motion to pass all of the consent calendar items from 3A1 through 3B7, 8, 7, 3B8 with the exception of 3B5. So moved. I'll make a motion, I'll second, I mean. We've got a motion and a second to read to approve everything except 3B5. Can you take the roll for us, Kelsey? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Now, uh, city manager pulled 3B5. S Steve, would you like to explain? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to turn it to our Public Works Director, Rob DeBell. He has a very simple correction that we'd like to enter into the record, please. Thank you. Uh, so good evening, uh, uh, Council Members. Uh, uh, tonight, this item is to approve a final parcel map for 29200 Larkspoke Lane. Um, there was an error in the subdivision agreement. That's uh, one of the attachments in the uh, staff report. Um, in, in, the, in the subdivision agreement, the applicant or, or the property owner is required to do certain public improvements. Those improvements are, are to underground all the overhead utilities on Larkspur Lane. Uh, the error in the agreement is it's actually a typo. It's in section A of the subdivision. Um, it, it says the planning commission conditionally approved the project on April 5th, 2022. In actuality, it should be April 5th, 2021. We're off by a year. Um, so it was a typo on that end. Um, and staff recommends that we make this correction and approve the subdivision agreement and the parcel map. And I'm available for questions. Thank you. Just to add on, uh, just for clarity, that's page five in the staff report. Um, it's under Roman numeral two recitals on the first paragraph, paragraph A. That's our only change, Mayor. Bruce? I, I have a question for Trevor, a quick question. The report says this is a ministerial act and we basically have no choice but to approve it unless there's some error in it. So we're, we're, not, approved, we're, not, we're not making a decision that we like this subdivision or think it makes sense or anything like that. So why is it even, why does something like that come before the city council if we don't really have a say in whether it ought to be done or not or not be done? I mean, it's it's for you to verify, you know, uh, that 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 uh, the agreement covers the uh, requirements of the final map here. So the the actual tentative map, which did come through the planning commission and, and sought approval, is where the entitlements were decided. So we're not looking at the entitlements here. You're just approving this agreement, which ensures that they do um, fulfill the obligations that they have under the map. We're just saying the map comports to what the planning commission already decided was okay, and we have no jurisdiction over. Essentially, but the agreement there does have protections for the city to ensure that, you know, the underground utility work does get done and that there are repercussions and warranties that are maintained in there for the city's protection. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Well, I'll make a motion if, if everyone's okay with that. To Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor uh, were there any public comments on this one? I'm so take? sorry. No, you didn't have any speakers for this item. Okay. Second the motion. I'd like to make a motion. We approve the final parcel map number 82454, incorporate, incorporating the correction as called out by Rob DeBell. And I will second it. That, that staff's recommendation to adopt the, the resolution and authorize the city manager to execute the subdivision map. I guess we're back in progress now. Yes, the meeting can continue. Thank you. I was just confirming that was staff's recommendation to both adopt the, the resolution and the agreement with the correction um, specified by Mr. Dubot. Okay. 
So we've got a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you be kind enough to take the roll, please? Mayor Crisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yurine? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. All right. That takes us to item 4A. And I've got a note here that the item was continued upon approval of the agenda. When, and they're continuing it to the September 12th, 2022 regular city council meeting. Should I ask for public comment on this? No. Okay. Uh, no, the item's been continued. Okay. So do we need to vote on it being continued? We are. We, 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 we did when we approved the agenda. Okay, good. So that brings us to item 6A, I believe. So who will be giving us a presentation? Jesse, I see you there. Uh, good evening, Mayor Grisanti, members of the City Council. Uh, the item for you this evening is a, a, a request from Allied Artists to waive facility use, staffing, and permit fees in the amount of $1,951 for an art show event at Malibu Bluffs Park. Uh, the event scheduled to take place on Sunday, October 2nd um, at Malibu Bluffs Park, as I mentioned, and it will feature artists, 15 to 25 artists throughout the event um, in, in appreciation of artwork. And, and Allied Artists is a community service organization, if you don't know, that coordinates several art programs each year uh, with the aim of promoting uh, the appreciation of the environment through arts and to support the cons conservation and maintenance of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. So uh, additionally, if the fee waiver request is approved, Allied Artists has agreed to donate up to 15% of the event proceeds uh, to the city, which could be used towards park conservation. So uh, not much else other than that that was in the staff report. So I'm happy to answer any additional questions you might have. And Barbara Freund from Allied Artists is also here. Uh, and she can answer any additional questions you may have as well. Okay. Do we have any public comment? Yes, you have two speakers signed up for this item. They are Barbara Freund and Lottie Sharon. We'll hear from Barbara first. Do we have any public comment? I'm sorry, Mayor, can you not hear me? Do we have any public comment? Am I frozen? You must be. I couldn't. No, I'm there sorry. Are two speakers. Yeah. Okay. Mayor, you have two speakers. Barbara Freund is ready now. Please. Can we have Barbara speak, please? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, I yes, really, we can. I am here just to answer questions. Um, I'm actually the person that can answer questions for the next item as well, which is with the Malibu Art Association. I am with both organizations. Um, and this is the first request from the allied artists of the Santa Monica Mountains uh, and Seashore to host an art event um, in a city uh, facility or, or park. Um, and uh, so they're very excited about the opportunity to perhaps get to use Bluffs, Bluffs Park. Um, and we're uh, going to uh, donate proceeds just like the Malibu Art Association does. Um, and in this case, it would be specific for um, preserving and maintaining park space for whatever the city would, would like to dedicate it towards, whether that be for Bluffs Park or um, Legacy Park or any of the other parks that you all have to maintain um, for that purpose. Great. Thank you. And Mayor, if you give me one more moment, I'm trying to find Lottie Sharon, but I don't see her in the meeting. And after checking, I still don't see her in the meeting. So that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. Uh, any members of the council like to weigh in on this? Um. I'm, I'm absolutely in support. I'm so glad to see art events coming back more. I know it's been difficult. Our permit process is difficult. I appreciate um, Barbara and everyone hanging in there as we work our way through all this. And uh, I'm excited for the event. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendation. 
Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the staff recommendation. Can you take the roll, please, for us? Councilmember Ewing? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to 6B. 6B is a Malibu Arts Association event fee waiver. I have a sneaking suspicion that we'll be getting a presentation from either Kristen or Jesse now. Yes, uh, good evening again, Mayor Grisanti, members of City Council. Um, similar to previous requests um, from the Malibu Arts Association, uh, this item is a request to waive uh, for facility waive facility use staffing and permit fees in the amount of fourteen hundred and ninety five dollars uh, for an art show at Legacy Park. Um, this has been scheduled to take place on Sunday, September twenty fifth, and the council will remember that you previously approved several art shows to take place between September two thousand twenty one and June two thousand twenty two. And so due to the success of those previous art shows, uh, MA has requested one additional show, which would be the sixth and, and final event permitted at the park per the deed restriction for the property. Um, outside of that, that it's a similar request to, to what was previously approved. And again, as Barbara mentioned, she's here for both organizations and, and can answer any additional questions um, outside of that. And I'm happy to answer any as well. Thank you, Jesse. Kelsey, do we have any speakers other than Barbara? Uh, Lottie Sharon has signed up for this item as well, but I don't see her in the meeting. Okay, well, let's, Barbara, do you want to weigh in? Um, yes, I would like to actually weigh in again. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so um, th this particular event, while it is the sixth permitted for Legacy Park, it's the fourth for Malibu Art Association for us for this calendar year, and um, and actually had been delayed because of some other permitting issues um, that I know you all are trying to sort out, and 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 that really is what I would just like to make a comment about because we're we're trying to do the, do everything the way that it is supposed to be done and and quite frankly it feels like every time i turn around there's yet another roadblock um, with something new and so for this particular september 25th um, we have the burden now also of uh, purchasing from an outside vendor the uh, certified mailing list for the um, residences and businesses that are within the 500 foot radius of the park so that the city can then do the mailing uh, to the public uh, about the fact that this event will be going on. And after, and we've not had to do that before. The city used previous lists that were available to them because there aren't any residences there are businesses that you all know are there, the veterinary clinic, you know, the Whole Foods, uh, the library across the street, and so on. Um, and But after contacting the vendors, this is an additional $220 that the Art Association is going to have to um, put up, which they don't charge their members for, and quite frankly, can't absorb. And so unless that's something that the city council is going to also be able to approve reimbursing or using a list that is currently in your possession from like the jazz festival or the chili cook off, um, then we may not even be able to bring this uh, to Legacy Park in September, and certainly, you know, not within the time frame. If um, planning needs to get that mailing out, they have to have the list by noon tomorrow. I was told, so I'm not sure where we are with this at all. Um, it's just really, really hard to to bring art to Malibu. It's just been extraordinarily difficult. That's all. Thank you, Barbara. Steve Uring, I see your hand raised. Hey, Santi, if I could, I'm sorry to yeah, just, uh, interject. Um, sure. Chair Chair Sharon from the Arts Commission actually had emailed me um, while I was speaking and just wanted, um, said she was having trouble getting into the meeting, but 
uh, that she was in support of, of both of these requests. So um, she just asked me to forward that along. Yeah. Thank you. Council member Uring. Yeah, two questions, Jesse. You, you mentioned that there's a deed restriction in terms of number of events we can have at Mel at Bluffs or at Legacy Park. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's similar to our temporary use, uh, the number of temporary use permits we allow, but this is actually in the deed restriction. I'm, I apologize. I wasn't, I wasn't here at the time that deed restriction was, was crafted, but it actually says six events at Legacy Park are, are oh, permitted. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Second question is who is requesting that they produce a different list for a mailing versus what we've been using all along and why the hell are we doing that? Um, it's my understanding that um, for the previous events, we were able to utilize a list, a mailing list. I believe it's planning and it's part of the temporary use permit process. Uh, we actually had a list from another event that was a city event that um, we were actually happy to share and, and it was still valid, I guess, at that time for those first events and it's no longer valid. So it's unfortunately that the, I guess why is the, it no? Why is it no longer valid? Why is it no longer I, I, valid? I don't know off the top of my head. I just know that was something that we could we could utilize before, and it's not available to utilize this time. And if we were, if it was something where, um, is anybody yeah, from the planning you, department you, online, you Richard? Can you tell us why Rich, this thing is not valid? Richard Malika, Malika. Sorry, you were, you were there for a moment, then you disappeared. I, uh, I am here. If uh, he can see me. Uh, the reason being is last year there uh, around the same time was an event that took place at the lumber yard, which is the same parcel as the park. And we were able to utilize the mailing labels that were prepared for that application uh, since they are a, a public document when they're submitted to us. However, this year uh, we looked and we did not have any labels for that property that were within the six month time frame that we require. And so that's why we were unable to find anything to help them out this year, like we had done last year. Is that requirement like a law or is that a policy or what just says you, you gotta have a list within six months? It, it's a practice we started using a number of years back because we were finding that uh, items would get to the planning commission and there would be noticing issues to where the public was not uh, made aware of the event or because people had moved out of the neighborhood, um, change of ownership. So because of that, I and I forget exactly what year, I'd have to ask uh, my admin staff, we enacted a policy of asking uh, for labels that are no older than six months. So it's a policy, not a law, it's, not a, not, it's a policy. Something we decided, gotcha. Uh, when we did the mailings in the past, have we ever had anybody come back and say they were upset with having this process take place? No, I'm not aware of any uh, concerns uh, on uh, these types of events in the park. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Mikey? Yeah, um, I, I didn't realize it was deed restricted at uh, Legacy Park. So that's something that is not changeable or what's the story there? Is that in stone forever? <laughs> I'm, forever? It's definitely something that, that I know those documents are put in place um, prior to the park being built. So I, I would argue it's probably less flexible than our temporary use party policy might be, um, our temporary use permit policy might be moving forward, yeah. There are a number of parcels there, though, also, right? To, from the park. What does that mean? I believe that, that there's multiple parcels that are that form the, the park there, so there, there may be restrictions yeah. that are for different portions of it. Oh, oh I see. So okay. we're talking the, about a legacy park, correct? Mm -hmm. So the six per parcel could actually be more than it appears, is what you're saying? Sort of? Potentially. Okay. <laughs> Maybe uh, that's something to look at. And uh, I just want to remind the public that uh, temporary use permits are on the agenda for August 31st at Zoracis. That Steve and I are, are co-chairs of, or whatever the term is, 2.30. And um, certainly, I, I think there's a lot of opinions on all sides on, um, on event permits, including 
particularly art events, et cetera. So I encourage anyone who is, uh, is, um, has feelings on that to jump online and let us know what you feel or send us an email for that. And then from there, it'll come towards city council at some point. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. I have a question. I believe that the legacy park is entirely a single parcel. Uh, but I'm, I'll pull up the tax assessor's book and look. And if we have a deed restriction, I would guess it was placed on it by the person who sold it to us at a reduced price. But again, I haven't pulled the title on it, so I can't tell you that if that's actually correct. Uh, when these lists go out, Richard, do we do they go out to every tenant in a shopping center or just the owner of the shopping centers that surround the property? Our notification goes to all of the tenants as well. Uh, so it is the owner and then all the, just like uh, if there were a part, if there were to be an apartment or condominium complex, we would uh, send a notice to each of the units as well. Okay. So uh, each one of those shopping centers has units, let's say A through X. And do we actually know who, who the uh, who the person is at each one of those units, or is does it just say unit X in the previous lists we've had? It, typically, I'd have to look at the the last one, but typically they they just do unit twenty three, unit X, and then the address. They, they usually don't uh, provide the the actual name. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Mr. Urain. Yeah, uh, I thought your comment that said that Jerry Parenchio sold us the land at a discounted price was interesting. I don't remember that going down that way, but that's okay. Uh, Richard, is there a way that we could use the existing list that we? If you go back to what you just said, we don't. We're not. We're not addressing these things to, to the owner of the or the business inside the unit. We're addressing it to the unit number. I mean, is there a way that we can use the existing list we have, cancel this $200, $200 they got to pay, and let these guys go out and do their damn event? Well, so, how do we do that? Well, uh, we we could use, uh, it could be as easy uh, of me just pulling the old file, uh, one of the old files in the area and uh, making a copy of those. The the catch for us as staff is that with our GIS capabilities, we are only able to identify ownership. So staff could check that the, the underlying property ownership is accurate, uh, but we do not have the capabilities of identifying renters or even the number of units in our city GIS. So, so just tell me, okay, I've not, okay. So I've got, let's assume I'm looking at the, the shop the village shopping center and there are 30 stores in that thing so if you pull your list and you mail to them you're saying you're not going to get to all those 30 stores well i i don't understand what you just said certainly that list will be as accurate as the day it was it it was created so okay. if they if something was uh subdivided or merged together we were not able to um, generate a list that would show that. So I can guarantee accuracy on the ownership end of things, um, but if tenants were merged or subdivided, so most likely we're probably fine, <laughs> uh, but probably fine is kind of a dangerous way to do things. Uh, but any changes to the number of tenants over there is what we would lose or, or perhaps be an error on. Okay. Man. Seems like a fairly simple process. We are making very complex, but that's. Mikey, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I, I agree with Steve. This is very frustrating. And, and uh, I understand procedures are put in place for very good reasons, but when they aren't working the way it was intended, it is, uh, you know, it's just frustrating. Um, Barbara, my offer to you still stands on this issue. So, um, 
Um, I'm glad to help out as a private citizen on this. So um, I just make I just want to see this art event happen more than anything. So that's it. That's my comments, and let's move forward. City Manager McClary. I just wanted to respond briefly to the comments regarding the the policy on on the mailing list. Um, you know, like many things, it's it's a trade off. Um, we could allow folks to use older, outdated lists, and of course, the trade off there is we, we might not be reaching as as many potentially affected persons. Um, but we can certainly take a look at that, and um, I think if we obviously if we make a change in that policy, we're going to have to carry that forward for for other applicants. Yeah. But uh, I'll talk to the staff and and see what we might be able to do uh, to make this a little bit easier. Thank you, Steve. This is a fairly unique situation. There's no residences within that within that radius, I don't believe. So it, I think that would, I, I don't imagine there's going to be any pushback from anybody on it. Okay. Can we have a motion to approve this? I'll make, make a motion. I'll, I'll make second. a motion to approve it. A motion and a second. Kelsey, will you be kind enough to take the roll? Councilmember Urine? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Paul, I really hate to ask. I need to ask for a very short break. I think it's a great idea to take a very short break right now, and I appreciate your asking. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. So it's currently 801. Can we come back at 811? That's a more right. generous break than you usually give us. <laughs> do you want more? Do you want more time? Less no, that's, time. That's, no, that's more, no, that's perfect. There's just the observation. Thank I'm you. I'm getting soft in my old age, Bruce.
Okay, it's 8.11, we're all back. Thank everyone for being so timely. I believe that brings us to item 6C. Accessory dwelling unit discussion, local coastal program. Amendment number 18.002 and zoning text amendment 18004. Do we have a staff report? Yes, Mayor Grisanti and members of the city council. I'm here this evening joined by our staff contact on this, Tyler Eaton, and also our consultant, Joyce Parker Bozolinski. If I may have the next slide, please. The reason why staff has returned to you is to discuss the future steps that staff takes in preparation of the ADU ordinance. The ADU ordinance is something that was initiated by the council um, in early 2018. It originally started as a activity to essentially put the definition and wording of ADU in our code. Currently, our code has second residential units listed and guest houses. And unlike other cities, these uses are by right uses, meaning that in some cities, in order to have an ADU or a second unit guest house or something like that, you need to get a use permit, something discretionary. In the case of the Malibu City Zoning Ordinance, as well as the city's LCP, all units in the city, residential units, are eligible for either an AD or excuse me, a second unit or a guest house. And so it's because of that that this started originally with just adding this definition. Since then, it's morphed to have perhaps potential development standards included. And those development standards have ranged from uh, We've discussed relaxing some setbacks and development standards, whereas maintaining. And also we've been discussing the permitting process as well. To date, there has been a total of four visits to the Planning Commission with this ordinance, the most recent being March 7th, 2022. At that hearing, we did not even get to the public hearing. The item was continued before the hearing opened. And at that continuance, there were a number of questions and recommendations made by the members of the Planning Commission. If I may have the next slide, please. And so what staff is here tonight is to present to you what those comments were that came from the most recent planning commission and to request direction from the council on how you would like staff to proceed, whether or not you would like us to prepare um, a request for proposals to obtain the additional information that was requested by the planning commission, or if there are any other directions you'd like to provide to staff. If I may have the next slide, please. Joyce will discuss the number of items that were brought up by the Planning Commission so that uh, those get vetted this evening. And also our city attorney, Mr. Russin, is available too to speak to some of the questions uh, that were brought up by the commissioners on whether or not the city needs to have uh, an ADU ordinance, uh, given that we're located within the, the, the entirety of the city is located within the coastal zone. So with that, I will let Joyce now speak about the additional studies and referrals that would be needed to be able to um, address all of the concerns raised by the commission at their last hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, on the screen are uh, some, I think the most significant studies and referrals that was requested by the planning commission. And these are requested uh, because the commission felt that with upon adoption of a new ADU ordinance, there would be a significant increase in the number of people applying for an uh, ADU. And 
that would result in a cumulative impact that needed to be studied. And some of the studies and referrals was a referral to the uh, Public Safety Commission to update the evacuation plan, a traffic study on the impact of uh, additional traffic on Pacific Coast Highway, uh, a request that the Water Quality Control Board uh, analyze the availability of uh, waters that, uh, of water that would be available for ADUs, an account of all the lots in Malibu that could be used in an ADU uh, and the services required to service those ADUs, an analysis on the effect of school population and the use of city sports facilities, an estimate of the policing cost involved in additional ADUs, and an analysis of low-income housing requirements and projected rental rate. Next slide. So all of those requests are based upon, again, on the understanding that there are going to be a significant increase in the number of ADU applications uh, upon adoption of the ordinance. Uh, staff does not believe that that um, is the case, and that is because the ADU ordinance, as Richard uh, mentioned, is um, basically mirrors the second unit ordinance. So it's an existing ordinance in the city. So it, it's, it's a the second unit uh, or an ADU is essentially a, a different name for a second unit. And so for most ADUs, attached, detached, and converted, it's an administrative coastal development permit for um, an ADU and uh, for the existing second unit. Uh, staff had recommend, recommended calling the ADU uh, coastal developer permit an ADU coastal developer permit uh, simply for tracking purposes, but certainly the planning commission um, can change that and just call it the same thing as uh, people are used to, and that's the administrative coastal development permit. So all ADUs attached, detached, and inverted uh, would require a coastal development permit. The director uh, is the, the planning director is the decision uh, authority on both a second unit and an ADU. Uh, and both uh, the second unit now is reported, any approval is reported to the planning commission and is appealable. And that is going to be the same, what staff is recommending and what the ordinance is that's in front of the planning commission is identical. Uh, all approvals of an ADU attached, detached or converted by the planning director would be reported to the planning commission. The planning commission could call uh, by majority vote, call that up for a full CDP hearing. Also, it's appealable. And so uh, people could appeal an uh, ADU coastal development permit to the planning commission and to the eventually city council. And if it's in the appeal zone to the coastal commission. So there's really, as you can see, no advantage um, as currently proposed the ordinance it, uh, in terms of permitting process, it would follow the same process as the existing code on second units. Next slide. The exception to that is the junior ADU. So junior ADU is essentially an ADU inside of an existing uh, single family dwelling. And currently, if a second unit was placed inside of an existing uh, single uh, family dwelling, they would require, they would still require an administrative coastal development permit. Staff is proposing that for an ADU, it's an administrative plan review. Uh, decision authority is the same, but those are not reported to the commission and are not appealable. Those would be processed under the city's municipal code, and that is because the guidance we got from the Coastal Commission is that if an ADU was inside of an existing um, single family house in, in a place in a habitable area, that it would not um, be considered development. And if it's not considered development, it is not subject to the LCP. So in this case, uh, they would these would be processed under the municipal code. Next slide. Just in terms of the development standards, uh, currently uh, somebody could come in and ask for a second unit uh, uh, 900 square feet. Uh, state law has established a minimum of 850 for a studio or one bedroom and 1,000 for two or more bedrooms, while staff has recommended um, a, a higher number at 1,200. Uh, that had to do with the Wolsey fire and the temporary housing. Certainly, the Planning Commission could decide um, to go with the 850 and 1,000. And, and again, the difference between what they can get now is a second unit and 900 and 
and what they might be able to get uh, through with a ADU. I'm not sure you'd see an increase in the number of units. The Basically, the, the only development standard that changes is if you, today, if you demolish and rebuild an accessory building that has substandard setback requirements, it has to meet current setback requirements. The ADU, if it was demolished and rebuilt in the exact same location, no expansion, it could maintain the existing setbacks uh, except for fire, right? So it would have to get a uh, sign off from the fire department. All of the other development standards that uh, are in the ordinance that is being considered by the Planning Commission are the same as the second unit. So again, no, no advantage to waiting until the ADU ordinance um, gets uh, passed and goes through that process. Next slide. And with that, um, as Richard indicated, we are seeking direction on whether to proceed with any of the uh, cumulative impact studies and referrals as requested by the Planning Commission uh, based on staff's presentation of whether there would be a cumulative impact and any direction um, that the uh, City Council may wish to give to the Planning Commission on the content. And that concludes staff's presentation. Okay, I'm going to ask, I would like to ask technical questions, but I think I should hear public comment first. So, do we have any public signed up to speak on this item? Yes, Mayor, you have nine speakers signed up and maybe a few more raising their hand. Your first few are Mark Bowdy, Sarah Laws, Gigi Birchfield, and Julie D. We'll hear from Mark Bowdy first. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I'll tell you that the three people after me are either out of town or, or sick with COVID or in one case, tending to a sick mother-in-law. So it'll just be me of those four. Um, I agree with uh, the planning department that this is not a sky is falling scenario, the way the city is currently built out. Even if the city is wise enough to pass an ADU ordinance that incentivizes, supports, and encourages small-scale one-story ADUs. Uh, I wouldn't think in this city, the way it's currently built out, you'd see more than 100 applications over 10 years. Um, I wouldn't study any of the 16 or 17 uh, fake questions identified by Commissioner Maza. Uh, those were mostly, in my view, just a filibuster tactic. Uh, and a stall tactic, that'd be an incredible waste of money. The only one that might be worthy of a look is whether you should try to get um, approval for violating the state ADU statute by sticking with your backyard setbacks because uh, clustering structures too close together in a fire zone can actually result in the embers um, spreading the fire faster. Um, I'll just say two things globally. The, the proposal to the amendment to the LCP that got put forth a year or two ago, uh, I think it was a combination of Bonnie Blue and one suggestion by Commissioner Maza at the 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Please do not pass that statute. All that statute does is continue the current policy and trend toward mansionization. If you want to encourage people to do small scale ADUs in the two or three large lot neighborhoods where there's no impact on coastal resources, where you may want to incentivize the construction of small scale ADUs, you can do it without violating Senate Bill 9 and the state ADU statute. The current proposal that was close to being voted on, and thank goodness it wasn't, is illegal in at least 10 respects. And the first judge who looked at it on a case brought by the Riddicks, which is a plaintiff that made some tactical errors in packaging their case, first judge that looked at it already recognized that Malibu's effort to pretend it's unique and exempt from the state ADU statute is a joke, and you're just labeling yourself as this elitist white enclave that thinks you can get away with this NIMBY stuff. Don't do it, put more thought into it. 
And if you're going to do an ADA you statute at all, and you're not required to. Mark, you can, that's your time. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Mayor, your next few speakers, I don't see in the meeting. They were Sarah Laws, Gigi Birchfield, Julie Deep, and Travis Parker. But we do have Cynthia Martin, and we'll hear from her next, followed by Scott Dietrich and Craig Hill. Thank you. Cynthia, are you available? Good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. I'm with Schmitz and Associates, and any guidance or direction provided by the City Council should include requiring no more than a four foot or five foot side and rear yard setback rather than regular setbacks. This was not addressed in tonight's presentation, but it was in the proposed or regular setbacks were in the proposed ordinance that was before the city council. This is mandated by state ADU law and the savings clause stating that state ADU law does not supersede the coastal act does not exempt the city from complying with state ADU law. Coastal Commission Executive Director Jack Ainsworth circulated a, mem a memo on January 21st stating that a balance must be found requiring compliance with state law unless there is a significant impact to a coastal resource. He also gave examples of significant impacts and those include ADUs requiring a shoreline protective device located in an ESHA or wetland or ADU subject to bluff erosion, flooding, or wave uprush. So the ADU ordinance should require no more than four foot side or rear yard setbacks unless there are significant impacts to a coastal resource. It's important to note that all other coastal cities with approved ADU ordinances without exception have implemented the four foot side and rear yard setback. This includes Santa Cruz, Pacifica, San Mateo, Encinitas, Santa Barbara and Redondo Beach. Alternatively, <clears throat> because the city is located in a mapped, very high fire hazard severity zone, another option would be to require no more than a five foot side or rear yard setback. And this would also be appropriate to allow for the fire department five foot walk around required by Title 32. It just makes sense that any direction provided by the city council right at the outset balances state law with coastal, the Coastal Act by requiring no more than a four foot or five foot side or rear yard setback unless there are significant impacts to a coastal resource. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, followed by Craig Hill, Marianne Riggins, and Joe Drummond. Hi, Scott, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Couple things. Uh, the main thing is the mapping of Malibu in a very, very, very high fire zone. If you have a four foot setback or a five foot setback, the radiant heat from adjacent buildings is immediately going to catch that next structure on fire. And you don't want that. We're supposed to be maintaining our rural character. Everybody gives lip service to our mission statement. Let's make sure we do that. Secondly, uh, there's a 12, suggested by staff to have a 1200 foot ADU. I reject that. We should maintain whatever it is, 850 or 900. That's enough. If you're going up to 1200, you're increasing the cost. And what we'd like is, you know, families to be able to move in there that might attend our schools. The bigger you go, the more expensive it gets, the less affordable, though I'm very concerned all we're doing is creating more short-term rentals. Um, last, when we look at this list of things to study, the first question that I would ask, and I think council should consider, instead of going through this litany of things, how many units we're talking about? We need someone who's an expert in this 
to come up with a number because we don't know. I don't know. Maybe you guys do. Um, but that's the first thing we ought to do and then look at the other items on the list if it's relevant. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Marianne Riggins and Joe Drummond. Hi, Craig, are you available? Hi there, yeah, I am. And I'll just say, I, previously I was talking about Malibu seafood, not La Costa. Okay, so um, personally I'm ep ecumenical on this issue, but it seems that every time ADUs come up, more new questions are raised than get answered. In retrospect, when this came up under the tenure of Riva and Bonnie, a lot of assumptions were made about the applicability of state ADU law to Malibu. Staff and the rest of us all pretty much jumped straight into the weeds. In my own case, I spent time with former planner Justine Kendall helping to work through the details. Um, eventually, I realized that we had been taking a lot for granted. The law does not apply in very high fire hazard severity zones, as LA County has already accepted. Of course, all of Malibu is a VHFHSC, and also the Coastal Commission guidance from Jack Ainsworth, which is really just a suggestion, doesn't specifically address the case where a coastal community might also be in a VHFHSC. So it doesn't address Malibu's situation. So in the first instance, it appears we have no legal mandate to do this, and that should be clarified before we keep moving forward, before expending more resources. It's been since March that this question, at least, that this question has been on the table, and we still don't have an answer to that. And until that's determined, discussion of all the details seems premature. Um, if and when it is found to be a legal requirement, then there are a lot of un unanswered questions still, issues of traffic, evacuation, egress routes, a lot of things need to be studied. Um, any and all of this would be considered legally development, including uh, a JADU, because that you get development when if you put in a piece of Romex or a pipe or anything like that by legal definition. And as Scott says, another thing we don't know is the number of units we're talking about. You know, how much how much would this affect and what would the traffic impacts be, et cetera? Um, there are a lot more issues that I pointed out in my memo from March this year that was on your staff report. Um, the memo also reminds us that not having an ordinance would not necessarily be a detriment to the city. It just means the second units would not be fast-tracked, but they could still be done under the existing regime of the LCP and the MMC. And um, finally, I'll, I'll just note that Coastal's concern is not with significant impacts, but they talk about identifiable impacts. So I think that implies, for example, that we would not want to be um, reducing the setbacks. But, but but again, all, all those kinds of details are, we're putting the cart before the horse. We need to figure out whether we even need this thing in the first place. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is Marianne Riggins, followed by Joe Drummond. Are you available? Marianne? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. So, um, I mean, I think this is getting very complicated, and I don't think it really needs to be. We already have second residential units in our municipal code and our local coastal program. Um, I don't think there should be any reduction in setbacks. I don't think there should be any increase in the amount of square footage that a property can have just because they put a second residential unit or an ADU. Um, you know, if the property can't sustain this and they can't provide the parking required for this additional use, then it shouldn't be um, something that they can have. You know, every property that we have has development standards already set in our codes. So really, this is just a language change to change from second residential unit to an accessory dwelling unit to come in conformance so that it's clear for both our residents and others who are looking from outside that we are consistent with state law. But besides that, I really don't think that there's much of a change that we need to be making. Our codes already address this issue. Um, we already have a maximum amount of square footage that's allowed on properties. We already have parking requirements. We already have setback requirements. We already have height requirements. Um, whether or not a unit's gonna require an additional or an upgrade to the septic system. So I think this comes back to how we're going to process these. 
and a coastal development permit is currently required for a second residential unit so that it can be properly vetted. Whether you want to change that to an administrative so that the planning director makes that decision instead of the planning commission and then it's appealable to the planning commission, that might be some way to allow people um, a little bit of relief from the code requirements. But again, our codes already have rules on these. Let's stick with what our code already says. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Don Schmitz. Hi, Joe, you have the floor. Hi there, thank you. Well, as far as I'm aware, ADUs are difficult to build in Malibu because we are in a very high fire hazardous zone and they are forbidden unless you have a separate driveway and egress out of the ADU separate from the main house, as I understand it. And if it says very high fire hazard severity zone, one where a lot or any portion thereof is located within a very high fire hazard severity zone and the lot does not have two distinct means of vehicular access a street such that the two distinct means of vehicular access as measured from the lot to the point of intersection with the street do not overlap with each other and each means of vehicular access is a minimum of 24 feet wide and improved with paving or other all weather surfacing. Um, so that's one major thing. And then my other concern is ADUs in geohazardous areas, which are not addressed in the staff report, but should not be fast tracked in hazardous zones, which I do believe this LCP protects us from. And state law says a minimum 16 feet height, but if it's possible, then it's better to say that an ADU should be no taller than the main existing residence. It doesn't make sense to have an ADU be taller than an existing home if it's an accessory dwelling. So if there's any way to change the wording of the ordinance, because 18 feet is too tall, and most of the homes in my neighborhood in Big Rock are no higher than 15 feet, or worst case, limit the height to the to 16 feet. And I can also see this possibly being abused with the rehab companies who will add one or two more bedrooms at 60K plus a month income each, and not for lower income bracket that it's supposed to be for. This will add even more water to landslide areas with 15 to 40 staff in and out. So some limitations on use of an ADU should be put in place like rent control, as Pat Healy suggested. That's all for now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our Mr. next speaker, Don Schmitz. Don, are you available? I am. Good evening, council members. I'll be as brief as possible. I just want to address a couple of the issues as they pertain to uh, references of this being a state law and the Coastal Act. It is indeed a state law, and it was passed with the very strong intent of supersedence. Uh, the legislature passed this law so that ADUs would be developed in the state of California to address the housing crisis. They fully intended to pass a law which required local jurisdictions to allow ADUs as a ministerial act. There's been a couple comments in regards to whether or not this is applicable to the coastal zone. Of course, it's applicable to the coastal zone. There is special dispensation in regards to that, but the executive director was very explicit in not one, but two letters written to not just Malibu, but many cities saying that you must respect the state law. You do have additional uh, discretion to protect coastal resources uh, as defined in the chapter three policies of the coast life, environmentally sensitive habitat areas, public access, don't propose and allow it to use it requires shoreline protection devices. But the chapter three policies, those coastal resources are not to be conflated with a local coastal program. Our LCP has very specific development standards for setbacks, for instance, which differ from other cities and counties, all under the same coastal act. That was something that we adopted for our development standards, but those are indeed overridden by the state law on ADUs. The four foot, which could be expanded out to five foot to accommodate fire department pedestrian access uh, would be appropriate, but we do need to respect those setbacks as promulgated in the state law. A couple other quick points. Uh, yes, we are in a class four fire zone. Our as are most of the cities that were referenced that have already adopted local coastal program amendments. That's not special, it's not unique. Uh, the County of Los Angeles has not outlawed ADUs. 
They have required that there be two demonstrated means of public access to a significant highway or arterial street. We could, in fact, do the same thing, and that would be appropriate. And in regards to fire safety, somebody spoke as it pertains to radiant heat uh, from structures. I don't know where requiring a percentage of the width and the depth of the lots as we currently have in our municipal standards is something that is promulgated in the Uniform Fire Code. It simply is not. And you cover that issue by requiring the fire department to review and approve applications uh, before the city for the ADU. So with that, I'll turn it over to your wise deliberations, council members, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Don. And Mayor, I want to note that I did try to circle back to the people we missed earlier, and they're still not in the meeting. So that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Okay, going back to the council. Does anyone want to go first? May I? Uh, can Richard? Can uh, can we have somebody put up the uh, the list of various things that we wanted? Uh, the various studies that were requested by the planning commission. Certainly, I'm working on getting that slide number. It's four, I believe, Alex. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. I'm going to take a whack at this. As far as changing the, the for starters, let me just ask you a question, Richard. Have, have there been any second units permitted for existing houses that you were able to utilize the existing septic systems or has it required a, a larger septic system in every case? At top of my head, I would say they've had to do a septic upgrade. Uh, if it was a, if they did not have um, a second unit there before, and and they were replacing it, um, so I would say yes for second residential units, guest houses since they don't have plumbing fixtures. I think some of those cases they've been able to add those. I thought guest houses had plumbing fixtures. Uh, are, you, are you thinking of an art studio? I'm sorry. I'm thinking more of an art studio, and I, I was fixated on the kitchen. Uh, the primary difference between a guest house and a second unit per the LCP is the kitchen. Right. Apologize. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so as far as uh, updating the evacuation plan, the evacuation plans that exist now, the city has been divided into uh, – areas and so i'm in evacuation zone 14 right now and other people are in a, other evacuation areas and i i don't think that that's i i don't see how you would update it on the basis of the fact that you know there might be some extra houses some extra apartments on point doom and as far as the traffic study goes uh what we're talking about is so small, I, I can't see that there's going to be a whole lot of additional traffic on PCH. I do see a problem with, with on-street parking in these neighborhoods, and I think it's essential that, that, we, uh, that we determine what areas are eligible for an ADU. Uh, for example, I can't see any reason that uh, the people in Big Rock who have been talking to us about not overloading the uh, the hillside and, and all the rest of that, I would say that that is not an area that would be appropriate for an ADU. Uh, the, and I think I would have a strong bias towards only having ADUs on on larger lots that are not hillside lots where people could have an opportunity to to build without a lot of grading and have a decent amount of space between their original house and the ADU. And I also have a strong preference for maintaining our existing setbacks, but I can understand that the the law says that we have to allow something closer and I would like it no no closer than five feet because otherwise we're going to end up 
in trouble with the fire department anyway, people just aren't gonna get approved. Uh, as far as the water quality control board analysis of the availability of water allocated to ADUs, I was up in Yosemite last week and uh, everything in the mountains is dry as a bone right now. There's dust everywhere. There's no water in the streams or nearly no water in the streams. Uh, we're we're pretty far behind the uh, behind the eight ball on water supply, and we shouldn't have as many people in Southern California as we do. Uh, there's an article that was in the LA Times about trying to set up a a treatment facility to deal with uh, with the big uh, water treatment facility we have down near. Um, down near uh, Marina del Rey and retreat, treat all that water and put it into, as set it aside as for future drinking water. We, we are pretty much at the limits of what we can accommodate already. Uh, as far as working up an account of all lots that could be used for ADUs and services required to service these ADUs, uh, I think it would be I think it would be fairly easy to figure out how many lots there are that are over a half an acre. And, and, and we have slope lots, for, slope maps for all of the city of Malibu and slopes, existing slopes are gonna knock out a lot of those. So I'm, I don't think that's a huge problem, but uh, as far as an analysis of the effects on school population and the use of sp city sports facilities, this is nonsensical. Uh, you know, the, the main argument I heard against, uh, against rebuilding the schools on the high school is that, you, you know, you're planning for, for students that may never come back. And then the, uh, the middle school just recorded a, substantially higher population. I think it was 11 or 12% higher than was anticipated at the end of the summer, at the beginning of the summer, have enrolled and are actually going to school now. So if we, if we build it, people will stop going to uh, private schools and they, and they will continue to be here. And if we manage to get some people in ADUs who qualify towards uh, satisfying our regional housing needs assessments, which is currently 89 units or making some progress towards that, that would be nice. Uh, people commented about not having any rentals and STRs, no short-term rentals in ADUs. And I think that that's already in the uh, document you've given us. And it certainly is in the competing document I've seen as well. Uh, as far as an estimate of the policing costs involved with additional ADUs, I, I really don't see that as a problem. Uh, I, I don't believe we're gonna have everybody applying for one right away because upgrading a system to accommodate an ADU is for most people is gonna end up being somewhere between 100 and $200,000 just for the septic system replacement. I don't see most of most properties aren't gonna be able to just put one in on an existing one. And as far as the low income housing requirements and projected rental rates, I, you know, we know how many we're supposed to have. Uh, I don't know how we're gonna get any, any of these as rentals uh, that are gonna qualify for that. But if, if somebody wants to, uh, through the goodness of their heart, build an ADU and, and put uh, somebody's grandmother in it and show that they're charging her a dollar, that'd be really great for us. Is there another page of these or is that the only page of these? This uh, it are the main ones. There were other uh, items in the commission's list. Okay. Most of them, I, I, I thought it was just silly. And I, you know, it, it uh, so 
that's that's my opinion and it's worth exactly what you paid for it so would anyone like to go next bruce uh first i have a question um we've we've heard discussion from various people about the vhf hz very high fire hazard severity zone uh, trevor is there a clear black and white answer is malibu because of that required to have this new adu structure or not required to it's not that it's the it's, a, it's that the local coastal program preempts the uh the state law which is what's going to matter for the city the very high fire hazard issue deals with sb9 issues we have todd leishman here from uh, my firm who's an expert on our housing laws too that you can, he can expand on that if you have more interest in the in the uh, restrictions how they play into sb9 well, as, as I, just before I, I would like to hear from Todd, but as I understand it, there's two separate and, and distinguishable issues. One is the relationship of SB9 to the Coastal Act. The other is the relationship to very high fire hazard severity zones. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's also an interplay of us being in both of them, which is unusual. Um, but I'm specifically focused on, is there some right of Malibu not to have to comply with these things by virtue of the, the very high fire hazards verity zone full stop separate apart from the coastal zone the sb9 is the lot split um the lot split state law that's not dealing with the adu laws those are those are different and that's what we're dealing with here um and so the, those only those issues um as you described deal with the sb9 issue um separately the adu ordinances have have the same saving clause for the coastal zone they don't have the very high fire um, okay, that's, that's what I thought. So, so the ADU law, whatever it is, we're not exempt from it because of the very high fire hazards of already zone, as some people have suggested. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, and exempt from it may be the wrong word, but there's an interplay with the Coastal Act that needs to be taken into account. Is that right, also? Yeah. So, so the the state laws do not preempt anyone's local coastal program, which we have in, in effect here, and so. Our local coastal program is not superseded by state law, um, but you know the, the the guidance from the Coastal Commission is that um, you know cities should put through an ADU ordinance that um, addresses the the purpose of this the state law. But in light of you know protecting our our coastal um, our our our, uh, our our coastal resources and also preserving public access, as you can imagine. Um, elimination of parking spots or issues like that could have public access issues as well. So um, that's the structure of of uh, what we're dealing with here. Okay, so now I have a loose, I mean, you know, the, the benefit and the detriment of being a lawyer is I, I, I get involved, I look at the details and try to understand what this is all about. The detriment is um, if I don't get it clear, I, I'm not, I don't understand it. Um, how, how, if at all, does this interrelate to the decision in the Riddick matter that, that I understand the city is appealing? What, what issues overlap between what we're being asked, if anything, and, and what's involved in that lawsuit? Sure. So the, the, Riddick, the Riddick lawsuit, um, the decision there didn't deal with any kind of uh, determination that state law preempted the city's local coastal program. It was a determination of the city's existing local coastal program um, provisions and specifically in the LIP, there's a list of types of projects that are exempt from the requirement to get a coastal development permit. And the the city has always, you know, um, has always uh, applied re required a coastal development permit for any type of second unit, whether it's attached or detached. And that's and uh, and that's because in um, I believe it's LIP section 14.1. I don't have it in front of me, but there's an exemption for um, for structures that are associated with a single family development. So it's, it states roughly that structures directly attached to a, a building or accessory structures such as garages, swimming pools, uh, fences, um, similar types of um, um, accessory units are exempt from the requirement to get a coastal development permit with the exception of second units or guest homes. And the determination from the court was that anything at, that anything attached to the structure was exempt from the requirement to get a coastal development permit and because of that then um, without a coastal development permit requirement it would then fall under um, state law and city municipal code to process okay um 
if the city were to do, uh, but I see Mark Gotti has his hand up. I, I know we sometimes do let the public rejoin with comments. Sometimes we don't. Um, I, I, Paul, if it's okay with you, I'd actually like to hear what he has to say as long as he keeps it to just a few minutes at most. Before I go on. Mayor, you're muted. Would you like us to unmute Mark Bowdy? Please unmute Mark Bowdy. Hello, all. Can you hear me? We can. Perfect. Hey, I'll keep we it. Can hear uh, you now. Bruce, I think your questions are spot on. Paul, your contributions were solid. I, I would answer the question slightly differently than Trevor. I believe that Ainsworth's January 22 letters make it painfully clear that the preemption argument is a stone cold loser. They're both state laws and you're not going to convince anybody. And you certainly didn't convince Judge Young in the Riddick case that the, you know, hide behind preemption argument is viable. It doesn't mean you're required to adopt an ADU ordinance. If you don't adopt an ADU ordinance, then you're just bound by the state statute. But I, I don't support or believe as a lawyer uh, for one second that the preemption argument is a winner or is clean. And in fact, even though Trevor is technically correct, Judge, Judge Young's decision on the Riddick case focused on some narrow issues and the Riddicks did make some mistakes in their packaging when they first presented it by trying to uh, expand their main residence beyond TDSF constraints, which is not what affordable small scale housing is about. You're setting yourself up for a series of losses. Not many, because again, I agree with uh, Joyce that you're not gonna see a lot of ADU applications. You may only see 100, 50 of which help you comply with your 79 suggested arena units, but you do have an opportunity here to make your city look a little better than just pumping out the standard, you know, NIMBY stuff you've done in the past. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So, Mark. so, so you know, that Trevor, his comments actually mesh with something I've, that's really been troubling me. Um, you know, I, I recuse myself from the Riddick matter because I, I, I'm both friends with and have a professional relationship with um, Jason. Um, so before this ever became a city issue and knowing I wasn't going to be involved, I had a lot of discussions to understand the issues. And it's clear as mud to me whether um, if we don't have an ADU law, we are or aren't bound by some default. And I know that was kind of touched upon, but not resolved as far as I could tell from the Riddick decision. Uh, but what is your view on whether if Malibu did absolutely nothing going forward, are we going to be pegged with some default ADU law that the state has implemented, or does that not apply here for some reason? And if so, what's the reason? Sure. So if if the trial court's decision in the Riddick matters stood, then anything any attached unit would then fall under state law or under our municipal code changes that you know that's paired with the LCP amendment are also changed to the municipal code to bring it into compliance with state law. Um, because if you're exempt from the requirement to get a coastal development permit, then you fall under the municipal code, which does need to comply with um, state with, with the state ADU laws. So that's that's how it would, would come into play. But for any project that requires a coastal development permit um, in the city, it would still fall under our LCP. And those are the regulations that would apply, not state law. And the specific call, carve outs, uh, I don't know, Todd, do you have the, the carve outs from state law that, that specifically say that that um, in, that this does not supersede the, the the coastal act or local coastal program provisions. Hi, Mayor and Council. Uh, yes, Trevor, I do. Let me pull that up, or just switch over rather. Uh, just for the council's benefit, um, the ADU law and the laws that were created by SB nine all have very similar clear carve outs toward the end of them. Uh, this is an example. Let me see, this is in the ADU law itself. It says nothing in this section. This is in government code 65858, uh, or rather 65852.2, subdivision L as in Lima. It says nothing in this section shall be construed to supersede or in any way alter or lessen the effect or application of the California Coastal Act. And I'll skip some citations. 
except that the local government shall not be required to hold a public hearing or to hold public hearings for coastal development permit applications for accessory dwelling units. And there's very similar language, almost verbatim, actually, in each of the two laws created by SP9. Is that what you're looking for, Trevor? Yes, thank you, Todd. And, and Todd, we, in fact, I, I believe we adopted a policy as a council that notwithstanding the fact that we're not required to have hearings, we, we, there, would be, there would be hearings. If, if I'm wrong about that, somebody let me know. But it, where I'm seeing the issue, and I think this is what Mark was getting at and, and, and what the Riddicks have argued, is there's, there may be a difference. I don't know whether there is or there isn't. There may be a difference between not superseding the Coastal Act versus not altering what we're mandated to do, because it may be that what's set forth in the default rules don't <laughs> counter don't countermand or countervene the Coastal Act, in which case that language wouldn't stop them from having application here. Or it may be that the default rules do countermand or countervene the Coastal Act, in which case that saving provision, it seems to me, would prevent them from having operation here. And this is not a matter of preemption. It's a matter of the actual wording of the statute itself. So where are we on that question? And if I'm misunderstanding it, please say so. But where are we, if I correctly <laughs> understand it, do the default rules contradict the Coastal Act, in which case under the statute they wouldn't apply here, or do the default rules not contradict the Coastal Act so much as they're different from the Coastal Act, which doesn't itself address this specifically, in which case we are stuck with them as default rules if we don't adopt something? And if my okay, question doesn't we, make sense, say so. I, I think it does, but I could be wrong. I don't know if you're asking Todd or you're asking me, but. I was um, asking Todd, but if you'd answer, that's fine. Too. Sure. Um, you know, th that provision is, you know, you're, you're going to have a conflict, you know, between the state law and between the city's LCP because a coastal development permit is required in the city and the city has a number of standards in place for ADUs in its ordinance. And, you know, as those conflict with state law, the ones that are adopted as part of our local coastal program are you know part of the coastal act and implement the implementation of the coastal act in the city and so it, to the extent that there's under our code we require six foot setback under state law four foot setback our six foot setback would would prevail um the state law does not preempt any requirement that's in our local coastal program so your con your your the way you're looking at is all of the provisions of our local coastal program are what is meant by the coastal act in the sense that the, the statute, to the extent it's inconsistent with our coastal program, doesn't super doesn't over doesn't supersede our coastal program. Is that what you're saying? That's yeah. that, that's correct. It it you know the the local coastal program is the implementation of the coastal act in the city, and that matches with the guidance from the coastal commission as well. Yeah. They recommend that you you make any changes through a local coastal program amendment. And is is that just your considered opinion or is there is that like black and white and nobody could argue to the contrary effectively? Well we've already seen that other people do argue to the contrary, Mark being one of them. But, I mean uh, of course, it is definitely. it is the thoughtfully considered widely held opinion of city attorneys. Okay. That, that's fair. By the way, Todd, how do you get that really cool background? Black background. I love that. It's just a black square. All right, I have to, I have to look for that. Um, okay, well, you know, because I, I, I say all the time, I, I start off with my analysis of these kinds of things, and I know we're not crafting a law tonight, we're just trying to figure out what we need to know to craft a law. But I always say, if, if, if we're prohibited from doing something, then by all means, we can't do it. If we're required to do something, by all means, we must do it. And then everywhere in the middle, I wanna hear from the residents and find out what they prefer. Um, I actually have heard from a lot of residents that don't want us to facilitate ADUs any more than we're required to. I hear from a lot of developers and developer representatives that they want us to, that's not surprising. Um, but so what I'm trying to get my arms around is what are we required to do? Because that will, to me, help establish what information we need to, to do it. But if we're not required to do anything, like I don't understand why we're doing anything. So. I might be able to help yeah. with that. Go ahead. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, the way I, I, I work with about 80 cities on, on uh, ADUs, and several of them are in the coastal zone. 
And the way I try to explain it is that um, there's a zoning side, which is governed by the ADU law in Government Code 65852.2, and to some degree, the junior ADU law in point twenty two. So there's the zoning side governed by the ADU law, and then there's the coastal protection side, which is governed by your local implementation of the Coastal Act, your LCP, right? And when, when things are being um, approved under just the zoning, right, when they're not subject to the, the LCP and the coastal protections, then state law sets forth how that works. The ADU statute says, well, first of all, no city has to adopt an ADU ordinance of their own. But if they don't, then they're only, then they have to approve under this ADU law, they have to approve ADUs uh, subject only to the two or three, in some cases, um, criteria for these little ADUs. In other words, they largely get a free pass. There's no, there's no limit on, on um, height. There's no uh, regulation of architecture, of landscaping. Um, it's, it's uh, very broad what can be done with ADUs under just the ADU law. Now, if a city has adopted a conforming, and by that I mean compliant with statute, uh, ADU ordinance, then, then, then that's what governs. And they can limit height, and they can limit architecture or, or regulate architecture and landscaping, et cetera. But none of that applies uh, if... Over, if, if the land, if it's in the coastal zone and there is an LCP and there is a set of coastal regulations, and because those regulations to protect the coast um, are usually, on perhaps always, uh, become the replacement for whatever zoning approval might be needed, right? So the the, the decision tree kind of goes like this: somebody comes into a coastal city and says, "I want to do an ADU." And the first thing to determine is, does the, does the Coastal Act apply? And if it does, it gets handled through the LCP, which the ADU law expressly says it does, it has no effect on those coastal regulations. It, it's only, the ADU law itself is only relevant if, if we determine that the coastal regulations don't apply and will not be the use approval then it fall, the decision tree pushes that over into the plain Jane uh, zoning code, which is where there's either a local ADU ordinance or there's not. And, and we're operating under just the state law if there's not. So, so that's how I try to explain it, is there's a zoning side, there's a coastal side. If it's in the coastal zone, you first look to your coastal regulations. It's business as usual there. By the express terms of the ADU law, it's business as usual there. It's only if that um, doesn't apply that you look to the municipal code, in your case, the zoning code, and your local zoning ordinance if you've got them. Thank, thank you. That, that, that's real helpful. So now, do we, do, we have, do we have things that are in the ADU classification that fall within only the zoning side and aren't governed by the coastal side? You would have internal JADUs that right. are... The junior ADUs are proposed under the municipal code only. Okay, so so we if we don't do anything with respect to anything other than the junior ones, we already have our existing local coastal program and the state, as, as under your understanding of the law, doesn't supersede what we already have in place. Am I saying that right? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, and do, do we need we... an existing living area? Then the Coastal Commission doesn't consider that to be development. Okay. And the, the junior ADUs, are they, are, you say within a house, is that, they can't be extended upward or larger than the structure already is, then, right? It's actually only a subset of junior ADUs and converted ADUs because uh, under the ADU law itself, a junior ADU or an ADU can both be created from space within the house that's not necessarily livable, for example, a garage. Um, but in, 
when it comes to coastal regulations and, and what is or is not development, it's only when they're cutting up existing livable space that it's not considered a new development. If they want to convert their garage, well, now they just added a bunch of livable space. That's development. Okay. Thank you. That was, that's all, that was all very helpful. I, I actually think we'd all benefit from a more detailed primer at some point down the line. Um, Mark, I'm sure you've got valuable things to say, but we don't usually call on people multiple times. So um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to advocate this time that you be called on. Um, thank you um, for that explanation. I, I don't have any further questions at this moment. And thank I don't have Bruce. any suggestions. I don't have any suggestions either. I'm totally lost. I, I uh, as, as, as other people were talking, I, I had a couple more things that I thought of, uh, which is dangerous. Uh, as far as, uh, I think we can all agree that beachfront houses have such severe parking problems that we, it's definitely not in the best interest to allow junior ADUs uh, to convert their garages into living space. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how we, we do that or incorporate that in this, but I think that's something that needs doing. Uh, if, if a property was designed with a, a garage and an apartment over it, and that's, that went through a full vetting, that's totally, you know, that's something that planning thought about. But I think that our codes that require off street parking are really valuable and especially on summer days and especially anywhere close to the beach. Because if we start allowing people to convert garages to junior ADUs on, this, on the beach, it's, it's already total havoc on places like Broad Beach Road and Malibu Road. It just isn't gonna work. So that's, that was my thought on that. And the other thing that I've been thinking about is, uh, as, as kind of a uh, hedge against SB9, uh, we have an opportunity when we're giving somebody an ADU to offer them a, a possible couple hundred square foot addition in exchange for a deed restriction preventing the property ever from, be, from ever being subdivided. Uh, and I don't know if that kind of a thing is legal or not, but it certainly would be beneficial to the neighborhoods. Uh, the big thing that people are seem to be concerned about with ADUs is that somebody's going to build an ADU and then they're going to, you know, SB9 is going to allow them to split the property in two and there's not going to be anything we can do about it. And I'm wondering if we can uh, defend ourselves from that by offering them an option of deed restricting their property so that it cannot be subdivided in exchange for offering them a couple hundred extra square feet on that. And I don't know what anybody else thinks about that. And I'm gonna call on Bruce to tell me what he thinks on that. Actually, I have some other comments, but I'm actually, I'm surprised to hear you advocating a deed restriction because I think when I raised that one time before you limited it to 25 or 50 years or something like that, to my great surprise. But um, I, I'm in favor of making deals that will help the city and, and let people do something here. Um, a question I forgot to ask before, Marion Riggins made a suggestion about just changing the word, um, whatever the word is we currently use to ADU. It seemed to me that doing that could wreak legal havoc, although I wasn't sure because of the things we've been talking about. Um, Todd or, or, or um, Trevor, is, is that something we could do or does that perhaps invite some kind of other legal regime unintentionally? You want me to take that, Trevor? Um, again, I'm gonna go back to that framework that I described earlier. There's a zoning side, there's a coastal side. If you're gonna have a local ordinance on the zoning side, it has to be fully compliant with the statute or it's null and void in its entirety. So it's going to be more than a name change on the zoning side. 
on your coastal side, where you have a lot more flexibility to protect coastal access and resources. What you have on the books today with the name change from second units to ADUs might be 99, if not 100% there. Okay. So that would that, that could be a beneficial change that doesn't produce unintended negative consequences. Yeah, I, but I mean, of course, you're going to want them to work together, right? They're going to need to kind of dovetail. But um, I, I, I kind of think that it might be uh, unhelpful to talk about the ADU ordinance because you've really got two things going on here. You've got a, a zoning ordinance that regulates ADUs when the coastal regulations don't apply, and you've got your LCP, uh, which you're which regulates second units and with a name change will rec will regulate ADUs. So, um, so yeah, a simple name change on the zoning side, not so much. A simple name change on the ADU side, uh, more viable, but again, you'd want them to work together. Okay. Um, in, in a similar vein, um, could we, in, in, in either or both of those ordinances, assuming the Coastal Commission would agree to it on the coastal side, could we require that the ADUs or the second buildings, whatever they're called, um, not be used for short-term rentals? And relatedly, could we require that they be subject to some kind of affordable housing um, pro provision that, that cuts off the amount at which you can charge rent so that we satisfy affordable housing requirements at the same time as giving people the ability to have another structure and to earn some income. Well, Mayor and Council, I'll take the first question first because it's easy. Um, the law expressly allows for ADUs to be, uh, or rather for, for short-term rental use of ADUs to be prohibited. Uh, in, in fact, state law requires that when it comes to a, uh, a big chunk of ADUs that would be approved, we call them building permit only ADUs, the ones that are approved under subdivision E, they're more streamlined, they have um, fewer standards that they have to comply with. Those cannot, under state law, they can't be used for short-term rentals. And then Excellent. the state gives cities, all cities, the option of further prohibiting short-term rental use and all the other ministerially approved ADUs as well. So so that's, that's very clear. That's a that's not controversial. Um, and your other question? Can we? Can it we? Must have been hard because I forgot. That, that's okay. No, you, you you've been very helpful. Can we create a cap on the rent so that they could be potentially considered affordable housing to work on satisfying our requirements in that end? In, in theory, yes. There's no express authorization in the in the statute. The statute just doesn't speak to that. Um, in the legislative history. Uh, of, of both the ADU law and SB9 uh, imply that the legislature intends for these units to be affordable by design, by virtue of being small and accessory, and for the most part, not um, separately conveyable. So it, there's definitely a, a sense that they will be affordable by design, but I have spoken with HCD about but affordable in Malibu and, doesn't necessarily mean affordable to the average person. Right. Um, but also in, in, in talking to HCD, they've, rec they've acknowledged that maybe covenant restrictions or, or similar might be viable, but that has ripple effects. Um, as soon as there's, now you're talking about essentially inclusionary housing, um, even one out of four would be 25%, that's north of 15%, and any requirement north of 15% um, pretty much requires a study, an economic feasibility study. And it just gets, it gets really complicated real fast when you start requiring affordable covenants. So I guess the, the short answer is that the law doesn't speak to that. It might be possible, but if, it's, if it is possible, then, um, there are lots of other pieces to that puzzle in which you're not going to want to mess with. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the considered um, answers.
I'd like to jump back in on the affordable housing uh, question you just raised, Bruce. Uh, it's it's not the amount of rent. It's it's the amount of income that the person who lives in the property makes that determines whether or not it's affordable housing. If they make less than a certain percentage of the average for the county, then then uh, it qualifies. What we have right now going to waste is, I think it's, is it 18.6 or $19.6 million available through us, through the state. But the problem is because of the requirements, uh, which are very strict about the rents that can be charged for the next 20 years. And, uh, and you know, it has to be monitored all that time. That's why we haven't had anybody take us up on it yet. And I think that uh, the the ADUs could be good for us or small guest houses could be good for us because, and we have as part of our housing that's in the current calculations, uh, the fact that we have guest houses where people are living who could not have normally afford to live in Malibu, but it's all about whether or not their income is where it is relative to the average for the County of Los Angeles. And it's uh, interesting, but quite a mess. Well, so I, one, I have one last question for the staff. Have we provided any guidance that's helpful to you so far? Because I'm, I'm not sure that we have. <laughs> yes, uh, some of the guidance from the mayor uh, was direct towards uh, the the multiple points raised by the commission. And then I also believe that you've been flushing out the issue and explaining just why we need this. Um, in terms of some of the other aspects, I know public comment uh, discuss, you know, relaxation and setbacks, uh, different considerations, depending on where the ADU is located within the city. Those are all items that have not been finalized yet. And, and something that when we return to the planning commission, uh, we will definitely follow up with the commission to get a recommendation from them to present to you on the actual standards. But yes, you are giving us some guidance on a number of those items that we brought forward to you. Steve, Mikey, any thoughts? Mikey? It's been really kind of a different sort of item to sit here and listen to you two go back and forth and ask all these great questions. It's kind of a, it's kind of fun. Um, I more have at this point, after a lot of discussion, I just have more comments than anything. Um, I agree that the planning commission requests at this point where we're at don't make sense to undertake those studies. I think that's all agreed. It just makes no sense at this point. Um, you know, as probably maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe the only person on council in the room right now that is a that has looked for affordable housing for our city, um, this issue isn't about it. <laughs> this is this is nothing to do with affordable housing in our city. So it's very clear, and it was said that. An ADU in Malibu is just not in any way come out looking affordable. It's just not even close. The only way ADUs end up being affordable is if the owner of the property more likely needs help or wants somebody living on the property for various other reasons. It could be elder care. It could be security. It could be a family member or a friend that needs help. So that, that filters down. It's probably not why you build it, but if you have the space, yeah, you might end up, and it happens quite often in Malibu, end up having somebody there that makes sense for you and your lifestyle that is more affordable. So really is the goal here affordable housing or expedited permitting um, when it comes to Malibu? Um, I understand that certainly uh, junior ADUs that might be a, expedited permitting in some situations that simply don't have any impact. I can get that. I totally get that. 
And I understand what Bowdy was, you know, writing up about certain neighborhoods and how that might work, ones that are more densely inhabited. But overall, um, I don't, I don't know that an overall goal, which I think is the state's goal of expedited permitting makes sense in a general sense for us. And I think everyone agrees on that already. Um, the one thing I want to bring up, and I don't think Trevor totally agrees with me, and that's fine, and maybe Todd doesn't too, <laughs> um, is when I was in Sacramento with the state attorney general, he very specifically said to our little group that as you're developing your plans to deal with SB9, et cetera, feel free to send to us what you're thinking to let you know, so we can let you know if we're going to go after you later. Now, as Trevor told me, you know, everything will go through HCD, which refers to the attorney general, but why would we wait if we don't need to? So if we're pushing any board or pushing, pushing anything, it may not be a bad option to ask the state attorney general's office if they see anything there. Now, of course, or not of course, but Rob Bonta was very clear that they weren't trying to go after anyone, they're trying to avoid it. Um, I think where I, I get um, more um, concerned would certainly be in setbacks. I'm in favor of a minimum five foot setback. It, it matches what we're doing on, on fire, what we need to do on fire safety. And, you know, having sat in those setbacks between houses that were trying to burn each other down alive and in person, I can tell you that, yeah, you need that distance. And I, I, um, I saw a couple of houses that did not survive during Woolsey because they were just too close together. It was too hot and too impossible to deal with it. it had nothing to do with ember casts in that point. It had to do with heat. So I think a minimum of five feet instead of four would be important. Um, I think Paul said this, but uh, any sort of... Uh, ADU type rules that um, put more cars on the street to me can be a potential disaster in our city and a public safety issue. And uh, I would not, not be in favor of that. Um, it was interesting to hear what Todd said about attaching rent control to ADUs. Um, I'm sorry to hear that that gets complicated because it's an interesting concept uh, that would be nice to explore, but you kind of took a lot of the fun out of it there for a minute. So um <laughs> You know, I guess it's a maybe, but uh, that study, you just, you seem to be, the look on your face is like, you don't want to do that study, but maybe we do. I don't know. Um, I got a, a bunch of other comments, but you guys have really kind of dug in there deep. If something else comes back up, I'll mention, but that's it for now. Thank you. Steve, hearing. Yes. Uh, I sort of got the sense in listening to Todd's comments that there was not a whole bunch we had to do right now to deal with ADUs. All right. I mean, if you go back to Joyce's original presentation, our second unit rules are pretty much in line with what the ADU rules would be. I mean, so the, the concept that says, do I take my LCP, change second unit to second unit and ADU, and can I live with that? Uh, and it sounded to me like the discussion that took place said, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that we can. And we don't have to screw around doing new stuff. Uh, and, you know, my sense is the people I've talked to are not real in favor of that jumping up and down saying we new, need eight new ADUs. Paul, your discussion, and you're going through the list of items, talked about one of the big ones, water. Where the hell's the water coming from? I mean, we got water in Malibu right now. We got a truck water up the Trancas. So why would I put more units in place that are going to require more water than I may not have? Because this drought's not going away, at least not anytime soon. 
Uh, so I'm inclined. You know, I thought that Todd, whatever you, yeah, Todd, I thought you were great. I mean, you you did gave me some insight that I hadn't thought about. So I'm inclined to say, look, uh, let's do the minimum we have to do. Uh, see if we can't take the LCP, change the language in there to make it second unit and ADU, and see where that gets us. That almost sounds like you're making a motion, Steve. But I, I'll, I'll make that a motion. I'm more than happy to make that a motion. Okay. Uh, is there a second? And then we'll get Joyce to talk to us, and maybe Marianne too. Is there a second? Could the motion be restated? Repeated, not 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 stated a different way. Yeah, it, 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 the, the motion was. My sense was that the, what I heard. And I, <laughs> let me say what I said. We can figure out how to make a motion out of it. Right? <laughs> you know, my my sense of listening to Todd was there was dealing with the LCP. There was not necessarily a whole bunch of stuff we had to do to accommodate the ADUs. So my thought was, can we simply take, you know, the LCP where it says second unit and say second unit and ADU or some version of that, okay, and use the rules we have in place to deal with ADUs. Uh, now, we may have to do something to tweak the, the junior ADU, but for the most part, that should deal with the, the issue that we're dealing with. And if you go back to Joyce's original presentation, that the second unit rules almost are identical to what we need to do with the ADUs, so it should work. So that's a long way to say whatever I was trying to say the first time, Bruce. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, just uh, let's let's stick with our, our LCP. Let's ch use that as the guidelines to deal with these ADUs uh, and go forward with that. The the motion then is to to, uh, to minimize changes from the current LCP, uh, which currently protects coastal resources and public access. And and uh, but to to bring it up to date with the with, with the language and does that also include that the the studies requested are, are are not required to before we bring this back to the planning commission? Yeah, the only one that may be worthwhile is taking having you know regional water quality come in and tell us that they're going to provide us any more water. What water to me is the big one. If we don't have you know we ran out of water in the last fire, so. But you know, if if we're willing to live with the LCP language, I think we can do without doing the the study on on water. So to answer your question, yeah, I'll I'll pass on all the studies if we can get that done that way with the LCP. I'm going to second this for the purposes of discussion, and then I'd like to ask uh, some of the people who, for example, I I don't uh, Joyce. I was going to call on you, and then I'm going to call on Tyler, who I haven't heard from yet. So Joyce? Yes, thank you. Um, so when we go back to the planning commission, um, the, the thing to keep in mind is that uh, there's an opportunity to, instead of just making a second unit, um, the ADU ordinance that is before the Planning Commission actually has requirements to deed restrict uh, the units. Uh, the Planning Commission could lower the height of the units. Um, so there are, rather than just mirroring the second unit provisions, there's an opportunity to fine tune the ordinance um, more than just changing the name. So I, I just, and also, I'm pretty certain that that's that the Coastal Commission will want the city to come up with an ordinance because they are um, a state agency, just like HCD, and so um, they are would like to like to be seen as working with HCD on uh, developing uh, sort of an AD ordinance because. Um, they're both state agencies, so they're sort of partners, so they, they don't want to be at odds against each other. So I, I'm pretty certain the Coast Commission will want us uh, to uh, have an ordinance. The Coastal Commission staff had reviewed the ordinance that's in front of the Planning Commission right now, and, and were actually okay with the ordinance. They didn't have any um, suggested changes, so... We we might be we we might be al almost there if if we go back to the planning commission. 
and they agree. And that's that's all. I just wanted to um, just emphasize that it's more than just changing the name. There are other elements that that the uh, council may want to look at, or that the planning commission should look at when they go back when it goes back to them. Joyce, when I when I read the the ordinance that was put together, it seemed to me be, be a full out race to get ADUs built in Malibu. I mean, the language in there 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 was nothing that dealt with any kind of coastal <laughs> impact. It was just you know here's what we got to do to build these things. So you know, I'm, and I'm sure the people who want ADUs would say, yeah, that's you know, good. but I I what I heard this evening was we have some options. And yes, I think I'd like to play those options. Yes, and and I'm I'm not sure what version that that if you were looking at the most recent version, because it is over time it is it has changed after um, we get more guidance from Coastal or we go to get feedback from the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, but for instance, one of the provisions that is in the uh, proposed ordinance limits um, uh, any any. Um, house or, or structure or house that is within a quarter mile of a beach or a public access way um, must um, replace any parking that they displace, which would deal with um, the mayor's concern about a loss of, of parking because uh, somebody on the beach could not convert their parking garage without replacing it uh, on site. So there's a, there's a lot of good things in the existing ordinance that the planning commission is considering right now. Okay. Steve, will you yield to Bruce? I'll yield to whoever. Yes. Well, I thought you wanted to hear from Tyler first. I would love to hear from Trevor and Tyler both. But you, know, you, you want to go first? Oh, I, oh. I was going to clarify the the, the motion. Oh, I was just going to add that um, in terms of water, each of these projects will be uh, reviewed by uh, the LA, uh, LA County Water Works District 29. And so um, each ADU that we see before the city will have to get approval uh, from the Water Works District. So there is going to be a review individually of each unit that um, comes to the city. Okay. And, and then I was going to ask uh, Council Member Uring. Your, your direction was to, to minimize the, uh, the the changes from the current LCP, but you know we're, we're still going to put forward a municipal code um, version, as Todd discussed, that complies with state law, and we'll work with HCD on that one. That 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 in, that's included in your direction. You were just talking I, about. I, I can live with that. Yes. Okay. Okay. So Paul um, or everybody, maybe I misunderstand the exercise tonight. I thought this was just to give guidance on what information, if any, or studies still need to be done before the next step is taken, not to actually give direction on the type of ordinance, if any, we want to see. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves if, if I'm right about that, because Steve's proposal, which may make sense, is to actually propose that certain steps be taken in a certain direction. So am, am I mistaken about the purpose of this agenda item? The agenda item is provide direction to staff on the proposed accessory dwelling unit ordinance, including on planning commission requests for additional studies and referrals related to adopting the draft ADU ordinance and whether to provide additional alternative direction on the content of the ADU ordinance. And I think we're squarely within that. Okay, fine. I was focusing on the studies and I missed the breadth of the proposing. So in that case, no other comment. And Trevor's hand is still raised. Oh, I, I, can, I, can, I can lower my hand. I'm okay. Sorry. And Point because I'm there. curious, can Marianne uh, say whatever it is she has to say, and then let's vote on this. Marianne, are you available? Yes, I am. Um, I just wanted to caution on the setbacks. Uh, since we do have such varied properties in Malibu, if you just go with a five foot setback, some of our larger parcels with acreage um, that could put them too close to property lines. And I think you should really consider staying with the development standards of a cumulative total of 25% for your setbacks with a minimum of 10%, uh, just so you don't cluster your development too close to your neighbor's houses. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marianne. Any other comments? Isn't isn't that to Marianne's comment maybe to whoever? Isn't that one of the things that could trigger some issues for us? Or am I misunderstanding that? Trevor, Todd, Tyler. Repeat the question. <coughs> Maybe I misread because a lot of material, but I thought that by keeping our same setback development, our development setback that we have now when it comes to ADUs might create create a problem. Um, I'm seeing Tyler shaking his head no. So yeah, there's there's no issue if we maintain the same standard as today. Um, there are certain um, like J JDs might have a, a different standard, but that would be the only caveat. And I think Joyce, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if you replace a uh, an existing accessory structure uh, and you rebuild it in kind, and that happens to be an ADU, in that particular case, if you had a non-conforming setback, you may be able to keep it in that situation. Uh, that is correct. Um, that is would be consistent with a state law, but if we are we'll have to work with Todd and, and Trevor on that as to how that would apply um, if we are not, if we are going completely 100% you know, under the um, LCP and how, how uh, the, the question is, which standards in state law uh, does the city, would the city want to include in the LCP amendment? Um, well, and that, that's so sort of can I can I yes. put a little final point on what you just said? What standards yes. in the ADU law uh, that govern ADU ordinances might you want to borrow for your coastal? That's, I think that's, that, that's, that's maybe correct. how I would frame it. Yes. Because when it comes to the zoning side, again going back to those two, when it comes to the zoning side, you don't have a choice. It's right. four foot side and rear. Period. On yes. The, it, on the it, coastal it, side, your right. setbacks can be whatever you think is necessary to protect coastal access and resources. Yes, and and the the ordinance in front of the planning commission maintains existing setbacks, and so the only um, the only type of ADU that would go under the municipal code would be the junior ADU, and that's inside of an existing building, so there would not be a setback issue there. If you go outside the building, you've you've put yourself in back into the LCP. Okay. Are we all as clear as mud now? Kelsey, would you like to take a roll? Do we have to take a roll call on this or have we uh, officially advised you enough? Is that a question for Trevor? Yeah, we, ha we have a motion in a second, so we should take a roll. Okay. And Mayor, if I could just clarify one point of that motion with you and Councilmember Uring, staff should still reach out to the water quality out of the water control board to analyze the need for additional water. Are you including that in your motion? I'll I'll take that off the plate right now. Let's see what the planning commission comes back with. Okay. Understood. And Bruce had a question for Trevor, I believe. No, the question was whether we had to take a whether we had to actually have a motion and Trevor said, since we already have a motion, we might as well vote on it. So that was the answer. Okay. Will you take the roll, please, Kelsey? Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? I'm sorry, Councilmember Pearson, your mic didn't pick that up. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? I guess that's a why not. Sure. <laughs> Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. That puts us at item 7A, I believe. All right. And uh, this is an item that is uh, amendment to May 23rd, 2022, Council Action regarding Malibu Library set aside fund for fiscal year 2022 23. So the report is Steve Uring and Bruce. Want well, us to give you a staff report? Is that yeah. Right? Okay. I mean, basically, it, to me, it's real simple. Uh, 
the library subcommittee decided to approve a grant for $500,000 to Laura Rosenthal and the library foundation she belongs to. I think the decision making was flawed. I think it did not agree with what the MOU, uh, the rules dealing with the MOU. And I think the grant was, uh, if legal is the right word, but totally uh, in, in opposition to what the set aside library funds were supposed to be. And so what, I, and it, it was done in a city council meeting where only three members were available. Uh, so I wanted to bring it back, get it vetted out by the entire city council, because uh, I think this is a bad thing for us to do. Hey, Paul, point of order is that they've already asked that this be rescinded. This is just an order. This is just an item to make that make that so for some reason, which I don't know why we're having to do that. I don't know that. Are we still debating the merits of this? I'm not debating the merits. I think that this, the, the library or the county, wherever it was, decided that what happened was as more investigation was put into their library foundation, I think they realized that it was going to get real messy and they backed off for requesting the grant. But I think now, there is. Now okay. we're in discussion when we haven't even had a public hearing. Okay, that's, that's well, then I'm just trying to answer your question. I think Bruce is next, and then we go to the public hearing. Yeah, well, that's, I was just going to suggest that we should go to the public hearing, but I just, I, I'll just add one point to the report, which is equivalent to what Mikey was saying, actually, which is that separate and apart from the merits of the decision, I think the point of this proposal tonight, as it has evolved, because it wasn't the case when it was first proposed, but the point of this proposal tonight is simply that the county at this point in time has said, never mind, don't bother with the proposal, with the grant. Um, go ahead and rescind it. So the question is, should for us to formally adopt a resolution rescinding it? Because for legal reasons, the, the grant having been approved, or actually it was only recommended to be approved by the county, but having been recommended to be to the county, we need to formally rescind our recommendation if we're, go if we're going to go there. So with that, I think we should have public comment. Thank you, Bruce. Kelsey, how many public speakers do we have? You do have three speakers signed up, and then I'm seeing some raised hands. Your first speakers are Sky Patrick, Scott Dietrich, and Ryan. We have That's... Sky Patrick here. Thank you. Mr. Patrick? Sky, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. There you go. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the record, it's Miss Sky Patrick, not Mr. Pardon me. <clears throat> no problem. I haven't had so, the pleasure. No, no problem. Just wanted to clarify. So, uh, good evening to the council. My name is Sky Patrick, and I'd like to take an opportunity to address this council on seven item seven A inside of seven B. The statements that have been publicly made uh, through these motions are grossly inaccurate. It disadvantages the residents of Malibu. The narrow interpretation of the MOU's explicit language regarding the set aside of fund to support the branch library is impractical and it disadvantage the improvements for the library for the Malibu library. Given the technological advances of our library systems, our virtual programs, our operational and other changes that have evolved and have been more prominent, made more prominent due to COVID-19 as a more inclusive approach to that great greatly benefits the Malibu branch. Before the expansion of technology, the phrase written in 2008 may have been interpreted in a physical expression of the library structure, such as books on the shelf or programs that could have been experienced by patrons visiting our library. But in reality, Malibu benefits from utilizing the library services in its entirety, its books, its materials, its collection through interlibrary borrowing, our centralized programs. It's also important to note that the city is able to access other social services through the programs put on by the library as a partners, as a partner with public health or workforce development, mental health, public social services, and parks and recs. Um, in current times, this language has the power and authority to cooperatively meet its own needs of the city of Malibu 
as well as share the resources with other cities and other libraries within the system. And ultimately is supporting the children of Malibu and the underserved residents in the highest need. The LA County Library con has continually complied with all procedures required by the MOU on the utilization of these set-aside funds, which includes meeting with the city, determining its nexus to the library, to Malibu's library and its services, agreeing upon a plan, and allocations are publicly approved by the Malibu City Council. It's also important to note that the LA County Library Foundation does not exist without the public library. It's the public philanthropic partnership and its bylaws explicitly to support library programs, expenditures for the LA County Library only. This endowment was never a gift of public funds. It was an expenditure of public funds and not prohibited if made for a public purpose. Sky, I want to that's thank, your time. I wanna thank, thank the council for hearing me. Thank you. Our next speaker is Craig, I'm sorry, our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, followed by Ryan and Craig Hill. Hey, Scott. Are you there? Yeah, thank you. The button just popped. Um, if you want 500 grand of public money to go down a bureaucratic rat hole, approve this thing. I'm glad it's going to get rescinded. We could take that 500,000 and allocate it for another branch in Western Malibu. That's what the citizens of this town would like. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, giving it to this ephemeral foundation makes no sense. It won't benefit Malibu. If there's something we can do to help the disadvantaged, that's fine. Let's put it on the table and discuss it. But this is bureaucracy at its worst. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Craig Hill and Joe Drummond. Mr. Embry, are you available? Yeah, I'd like to correct something. I mean, I, I'm shocked as a taxpayer to have heard what I heard out of a county person. Um, 500000 would barely cover her salary and benefits for one year. And to say that for any public purpose, this money could work and that the MOU that was approved by the county uh, before her time was has to be narrowly construed is a problematic. Um, that's outrageous. And the only the reason the MOU exists is because the county was raiding our money and giving it to other libraries for dozens and dozens of years and never paid a dime back. And we had to wait about 10 years to build up some money before we could even remodel the dopey library that we inherited with its moldy carpet and unusable downstairs. And it was only after a city audit that we found out how much they were basically stealing out of the, the Malibu community. And we need the second library, which would likely be in Western Malibu because you wouldn't put two libraries right next to each other. And the MOU specifically has a provision and it anticipates the creation of a second branch of the Malibu Library. The second misrepresentation was for some reason that the Malibu Library we now have is not entitled to the full services of the, Mal of the LA County Library System, which may or may not include online content and streaming, of course, which is part of the greater collection of the Malibu, I'm sorry, of the LA County Library System. So that had nothing to do with anything. And how Parks and Rec and, and paying for mental health services out of the library funds, that's encroaching on another uh, department of LA County, which is uh, you know public health. So we've got some problems here of, of staying in your lane with this uh, tax entity. This, the funds specifically say that they are to be spent at the Malibu branch. I don't know which part of that sentence in the MOU that the county bureaucrats don't understand. I wanna uh, also list to you that there is um, uh, item number 23 in the MOU, which is enduring. And it says the County of Los Angeles shall indemnify the city of Malibu and you got to read that one over. Somebody please pull that up right now. 
because it's the county that is unilaterally and ultimately allowed to uh, make final determination of these funds. And the state of California Constitution, Article 16, Section 6, prohibits the gift of public funds, and, and not narrowly. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Joe Drummond and Mary Ann Riggins. Hey, Craig, are you available? Mr. Hill? There I am. It took him a minute to unmute me. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I sent you a letter on this months ago now, and so I'll try to be brief, and some of the things I said have been touched on now, but there were some commotions, so I looked at the MOU closely, and the language in it is explicit in supporting only materials and services at the Malibu branch. That's specified in several places in the MOU, as well as in the 2008 staff report written by then Administrative Services Director Reva Feldman. So I guess it's a foregone, clu foregone conclusion now, but you, you can't legally make the distribution requested um, to support anything of benefit elsewhere in the county. I have citations in the letter that make that quite clear. And, um, you know, we've heard some noble words and none of which are relevant, except maybe what Scott just said, that if, you know, we want to do something to, to benefit others, we can address that in a, a separate, different way. But this is not that. The MOU is clear. And I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Joe, right, are you available? Hi, yes, thank you. So two things, the library set aside funds are geographically limited to the Malibu branch. And as set forth in California Constitution, Article 16, Section 6, it is illegal to give gift public funds. To put this request for an endowment in context, in 2019, the city gave the county library funding, 300,000 over two years to hire an executive director and essentially restart the library foundation. It never legally should have been able to do this as per our MOU with the county on this. Please look at all the data that has been compiled. The city gave them 300,000 and it went to one person's salary. If you go back to the website, they literally do nothing but link to other resources. They are also frivolous with their spending, such as on a 4,800 personal retreat and despite paying a CPA somewhere, the taxes for 2021 are unavailable. This is not an organization that anyone should re recommend giving money to. Take that 800,000 and some of the fees from the law, tow lot at Heathercliff and start a library fund plan for a library shoe mash museum at Heathercliff. The shoe mash contributed so much to Malibu being our original residence. There are many treasures even in residents' possession from development on their property. It would be great to have a place to donate and showcase these items and their culture. They need to be honored and shown more respect. It would be welcome here to use our library funds to use existing owned land or even better purchase a new lot and have some kind of library museum in Shumash name or community center mental health services um, and for the west side of Malibu, especially a place to cater to our 25% population of seniors. Please do not give this money illegally outside of Malibu and put us further in a further liability situation. Just because friends ask doesn't mean you can give away our funds that are dedicated and allocated to our own city's resources. We have lots of open space recently purchased, or we need this money, and we need this money to buy land, design, and construct Malibu's second library branch, as specifically noted and provided for in the 2008 Memorandum of Understanding between the City of Malibu and Los Angeles County. Also, as Karen Ferrer is already on the LA County Library Subcommittee, is a conflict of interest for her to remain on the city's library subcommittee. An attorney like Bruce, who knows and follows the law, should replace her on the committee. There should either be an investigation of malfeasance or conspiracy to give public funds and in further contravention to the MOU's specific restriction that set aside funds will be used solely to improve Malibu branch facilities and services or receive a refund of these funds that were improperly and illegally gifted. The county gets a majority of our taxes over 200 million. They should be approached for such funding and not us. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Our next speaker is Mary Ann Riggins. Are you available, Marianne? Yes, I am. Um, I wasn't going to go into too much detail about how these funds were voted on previously. Um, I was just going to make suggestions on their use in the future, um, whether this money is returned or not allocated. Um, I think that we really should be working on programs for education and outreach 
if we do want to include other members of the community of the county, um, let's create programs for our children to be teaching about water conservation, uh, environmental issues. We've got Legacy Park that was built specifically for education. It's already set up for that. Let's use those funds here in Malibu and we can outreach to other areas in the county um, to show that we are working as a community, not just in our small area. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Marianne. And Mayor, uh, that concludes public comment. Wonderful, that brings us back to the council. Bruce, do you have a motion? I have some, dis well, the, sure, I'll make a motion then I'll have some discussion. The motion is to um, vote to rescind the previous recommendation that the county approve a $500,000 contribution from the Malibu, Set Malibu Library Set Aside Fund to the um, County Library Foundation. I'll second. Okay, motion now, and a second. Okay, is now. There any discussion? Yeah, the dis discussion is this. Um, I, I think this one's a no brainer because the county has already sent us a letter saying, yes, go ahead and do it. Uh, in fact, I think it may have expressed a preference for us to do it. Um, ultimately, this is a decision for the county. The, the MOU expressly states that all we get to do is make recommendations. Basically, we, it's, it's like um, they'll have to listen to us before they make their decisions, but they reserve all rights to make all decisions as to what should or shouldn't be dispersed, subject to the, re the requirements of the MOU. Um, I think this is not permissible under the requirements of the MOU, uh, and I think it would be inappropriate for the county to make this disbursement, but I, see, I think it seems unlikely that they'll make the disbursement after asking us to rescind the recommendation that they do so. Um, Ms. Patrick spoke about matters that go to the next item, so I'm going to hold off comment on them. Um, I, I didn't think it was really, she, she, in fact, I think she spent most of her time talking about the next item and not this item, for which the mayor usually cuts people off when they do that, but um, that's fine. She had her say. Uh, I'm also going to suggest, actually, when we get to that, that we withdraw that item for tonight and bring it back another time when we're all together. Um, but in any event, the motion is to um, approve the recommendation to rescind the. Uh, I'm sorry, approve. Yeah, approve the mo approve the result the recommendation to rescind the recommendation. <laughs> Complicated, but that's what we do. Okay, Steve. Yeah, I just uh, you know, and I'm I'm not going to drag this out any longer than we have to, but I, I was, I think it's important for us to recognize that the decision process that we went through to get this $500,000 was really flawed. I mean, if, if you just take a look at what we do with general fund grants in Malibu, all right, if somebody wants a general fund grant, they got to give us tax returns, they got to give us budgets, they have to give us information how the money is going to be used. They have to do, they got to go through nine miles of barbed wire and broken glass to get there. And that's for a grant of somewhere between two and $10,000. In this case, we gave away $500,000 and never asked a single question of anybody. We never looked at a tax, we never, we never looked at or, or an org chart. We never looked at tax, re we didn't look at anything. And I'm just hoping that as we sort of move down the line, the next library subcommittee will have a little bit more respect for the residents' money and be a little more careful before they start handing it out without any kind of discussion or investigation. So I'll let that go with that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Trevor? I, I see wanted, Trevor's hand raised. I just wanted to clarify that this the, the motion is actually to amend the council action of May 23rd, 22 to rescind approval of the $500,000 endowment for the Los Angeles County Library Foundation. That, that's the action, correct? Actually, I think that's misstated because all the city does is recommend what the county should do. So that was the action. Was The action wasn't doing it. The action was to, to make the recommendation to approve those um, items because there are a number of items besides the $500,000. Right. So th this, this motion is to recommend, is to, rescind the recommendation to the county to make a contribution of $500,000 to the County Library Foundation. We're okay. rescinding approval, it says, of the $500,000 endowment to the LA County Library Foundation. 
Yes, and what I'm saying is that that is misstated because technically this council does not approve any distributions. The council only approves recommendations to the county. Yeah, the, the, the suggested motion was to amend the action to rescind approval. So um, I, I just want to clarify that the, the, the action taken that day, I think it was a minute order, it, well, it, it's, it's just to direct them to rescind the approval the recommended sure. approval of the 500,000, correct? Well, if, if that's what, if, if I wasn't at that meeting and I didn't study the words, but if what the council did was approve a contribution, that's doubly wrong because not only should the contribution not be made, but the council lacks any legal authority to make a contribution. No, it was, it, it was just to recommend that, that, that was the, that, that was what the, the action was. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna state it one more time and I thought it was clear. The motion is to rescind the recommendation to the county to make a contribution of $500,000 to the County Library Foundation from the Malibu Library Set-Aside Fund. Okay. As long as the effect is the same, Steve, you're okay with that? I'm happy with that. All right. Kelsey, will you take the roll now? Mayor President Please. Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? No. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. And did I hear we're at item 7B, and I think I heard that Bruce is going to ask that we uh, delay this to another uh, another meeting. Is that correct? I, I well, this has been we've been delaying things and delaying things. Can we just get something done? It's 10:07. Let's just finish this. We well, yes, that's, we've gotten a lot done, I think. My motion is to withdraw the proposal to ask, to direct Steve to send a letter to the county demanding the return of about $1.5 million of misspent funds, um, because I think we can better discuss this another time. But if, you know, if we get outvoted on withdrawing it, we'll, we'll discuss it. Can we make a motion before we have uh, public comment on this item, Trevor? Or can we withdraw it before we have public comment? So the motion is not to continue it, but rather to to uh, make a determination to cancel or withdraw the action. Is that correct? No, continue it to a date uncertain. Okay. To continue to a date uncertain does not require us to open the, the public hearing. Okay. Do we have a second on the motion to continue to a date uncertain? I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. I see no hands raised. Should we take a roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? No. Mayor Grisanti? If I say no, we have a tie and nothing happens. We move forward. Okay, so I'll say no. Okay. Motion fails. Okay, let's get, let's get rid of this thing. Uh, so. Okay, so you wanna report? I wanna report. Okay. Um, well, there's a, there's a 13 page written report in the, um, agenda packet, uh, which has been by some publicly misdescribed and I, I think purposely, um, the proposal here is that we, we direct the city manager to, uh, request or demand from the county that they return approximately $1.5 million of funds that have been taken from the set of library set aside fund, Malibu library set aside fund over the past eight years for countywide purposes, even though as a legal matter, the funds are only available for the Malibu branch facilities and services and potentially for the construction of a West Malibu library um, addition. Um, the county librarian spoke earlier and basically made an argument 
first of all, about some recent events compelling a different analysis, although this goes back to 2015. Um, and the argument was, well, everything that happens countywide benefits Malibu, therefore any, basically everything and anything's okay. If that were so, the MOU would be completely meaningless. The MOU, just to give some history, as Ryan started to say earlier, um, but this is discovery. discussion. This is not. This is, not, this is not listing the item. This is not discussion. This is, in fact, a report which is going to be a brief summary of the 13-page written report. And that's what we get from staff all the time: is a PowerPoint presentation that goes on for five or ten minutes describing what's been proposed, which is what I'm doing. I just don't have a PowerPoint. So um, the MOU was the result of the city discovering that the tax dollars from Malibu residents that are supposed to go to the map for the benefit of the Malibu library were being predominantly spent countywide for county library purposes and not for the benefit of Malibu. Um, of the 93% of our tax dollars, of our property tax dollars that the county retains and only gives us back 7%, 2.5% of that 93 is is devoted to the library and it's supposed to be for the Malibu library. The city realized in the late 2000, first, in the first decade of 2000, that the money was being largely spent on countywide operations. And in fact, the city council approved a, a proposal to separate from the county library system completely. That would result in the two and a half percent of the property taxes, which today amount to about $6 million a year, be kept by Malibu or returned to Malibu. And Malibu would use them for its own library as it sees fit for that library or libraries. At the same time as the separation was going to occur, negotiations were ongoing with the county to establish a legal system that, ma that mandated that Malibu's property taxes that go to the county for the library be segregated and devoted exclusively to the Malibu Library and not a penny of them spent for countywide services. The county agreed to that as a legal matter in order to avoid Malibu withdrawing from the county library system. And the county gets benefits just from Malibu being a, a part of the system, as I think is the, op is the concomitant aspect of what the librarian was talking about. All the libraries benefit from them all being there. So Malibu staying in the system provided a benefit to the county and to all other libraries in the county, but the quid pro quo, and that was legal quid pro quo, was that the requirement was going to be going forward, not a penny of Malibu's tax dollars would be spent for the benefit of countywide programs. Well, guess what? Ten, here we are seven years later or 10 years later, and as detailed in the um, report, $1.5 million have been authorized by the county to be distributed for countywide programs that are not in Malibu. And those are listed on the next to the last and on the next to the last two pages of the report. $43,000 for special collections in other libraries in fiscal year 2015 to 16. This is for the benefit of low income communities, which is an admirable cause but it violates the legal requirement that the money be spent exclusively in Malibu. $92,000 for quote, family place programs in other libraries outside of Malibu. That was in 2015 to 16 as well. A $50,000 for a roving special children's collection to be used throughout the county library system in 2016, 17. But you know, 10,000 here, 10,000 there, it adds up. Again, adds up to $1.5 million. Um, it, and it would get larger and larger, $100,000 in 2016 to 17 for ebook readers, uh, 50 of which would be for Malibu and the other 50 of which would be throughout the county library system. $148,673 in 2017 to 18 for the description, quote, programs throughout the county library system, close quote. I don't understand how anyone who understands the English language can um, make that and harmonize that with will be used solely to improve branch facilities and services. Branch facilities is defined in the MOU as the, the Malibu branch of the library, other than by accepting the contrived statement that we heard tonight, that everything that benefits everything, that everything that benefits any part of the county benefits Malibu. If that's the case, we don't have an MOU, it's meaningless. So um, the proposal is that we stand up 
to the county, say, look, you've been taking our money. Um, yes, the city council recommended that they do this, I think erroneously and without getting advice from the city attorney that it was improper. Um, and this is our money. It could be $1.5 million, a lot of money, it could be used to help begin building a library in West Malibu, which also is accounted for in the MOU. And frankly, if we don't do this, and even if we do do this, I, I'm going to bring back a proposal at some point that we actually separate from the county and start keeping our tax dollars and put them to better use in Malibu, because this is ridiculous that anything that, be that benefits the entire county benefits us, so therefore it falls under the rubric of use solely for the benefit of Malibu. Thank you, Bruce. Sure. So is it now time to hear public input? Unless Steve has anything to add to the report. Uh, I, I, think, I think you said it well. Okay. Who do we have to speak to us, Kelsey? You have five speakers signed up for this item. They are Sky Patrick, Joe Drummond, Laura Rosenthal, Ryan, and Scott Dietrich. We'll hear from Sky Patrick first. Thank you. Ms. Patrick, are you available? Yes, thank you, uh, council members. I certainly understand uh, why there's so much um, confusion. Uh, the only thing I will say to the council at this time is that we all, both the county library and the previous council for Malibu acted in good faith. And I understand that the memo, the MOU states that the monies should be solely used for Malibu Library. But again, I stated earlier that many of many ways in which we utilize services has changed. The way that we utilize services has moved towards technology. And there is no real physical expression other than creating um, a, a secondary library, which has not, which the city of Malibu has not overtly had the appetite to do. Um, we discuss these recommendations every single year prior to my arrival and since my arrival. And this is, these are recommendations that we create together, the, the county library and the city library. So I'm sorry, the county library and the city of Malibu. So I just want to say to the council that I, I wish that you would also take a look at the, your needs assessment and the ways in which we utilize these funds are consistent with some of the recommendation in the needs assessment that the city of Malibu um, uh, uh, approved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Patrick. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Laura Rosenthal, Ryan, and Scott Dietrich. Hello, Joe. Are you available? Hi. Uh, yes. I'm. I mean, I hear, I hear what um, Sky is saying, but I still don't agree that the money still should be um, returned, and and it has to stay in Malibu. It, and we we all have wanted a, a Western branch for the library. It just hasn't been acted upon, and that's what we need to do. And like I agree with Bruce that the county is already taking too much of our tax dollars, and we need to keep what we can in Malibu because we are we we only get seven percent of our tax dollars, which is insane. That's just way too little. So we would we could have so much more here in Malibu. That's all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Laura Rosenthal, followed by Ryan Scott Dietrich and Marianne Riggins. Hi, Laura. Are you awake and ready to speak to us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to speak to a few matters. The first is the donation to the Library Foundation for three hundred thousand dollars, not three fifty in the memorandum by Bruce. It was discussed at the library subcommittee meeting of which Jefferson Wagner and I were members. According to the minutes, it was Jefferson who proposed the motion to which I concurred to agree to this and send it to the full council. It was then approved by the entire council unanimously, including Jefferson at a city council meeting. The next issue is about the LA County Library Commission. Bruce writes, and I quote, for the first few years after the MOU was executed, Council Member Ulick served as Malibu's representative on the LA County Library Commission, 
which oversaw the growth and use of the Malibu Library Fund. The watchdog on Malibu's behalf to ensure that the Malibu Library Fund was properly grown. This does not represent what the commission does. The mission of the commission is to advise the supervisors and the county librarian on matters of library policy, administration, operation, and service to obtain public input and to make suggestions and recommendations. I wanted to clear this up, especially since Pamela was unable to make most of the meetings during her time on the commission. I succeeded Pamela on that body and served for six years. It was there that I learned of the great disparities in services between the different libraries in the county system. This was due to the structural deficit that the system must deal with and that almost all other libraries in the system do not enjoy the extra hours, collection, staff, and programs that we enjoy here, even though we, just, we have just a fraction of our residents that use the library. I saw libraries with hundreds of visitors a day that had to close its doors to students who wanted to use the Wi-Fi after school hours, to parents who couldn't take their little ones to the library on the weekend because it was closed, to seniors looking for collections that didn't exist at their home library. It was clear, according to our then county librarian, that we could provide funds for programs for Malibu and for countywide programs and for other libraries. Our speaker series, which I started, brought people from all over the county. It was a privilege to provide services to others. Lastly, I want to refer to the library needs assessment and, they do, and that they do not specifically recommend a West Malibu branch. And in fact, call out that the Malibu Library has a hard time attracting and retaining staff and that it would be much more difficult for a West Malibu branch. What was discussed was holding more events like the speaker series or a bookmobile that could visit the West End like it used to when my kids were young. I reached Laura, out to- Laura, that's your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Scott Dietrich and Marianne Riggins. Mr. Embry, are you available? Uh, yes, and, and again, I, I find it highly inappropriate that a county official would lobby to circumvent the legal agreement between the city of Malibu and the Board of Supervisors, which essentially guts it. The whole reason the MOU exists is we caught them basically shortchanging Malibu of the money we're paying in. We had a really dopey library we had to wait and save up money, you know, and remodel it. And now we've had to wait and save up more money. And the idea is, I'm sorry, Laura, you wanted, this is now 800,000. You, you somehow got 300,000 and they want 500,000 more. And it's just not legally possible. First of all, the county has to behave in good faith and uphold this agreement. And there is the provision number 23 that the county must indemnify the city. I think those things are going to be kicking in. Now, here's the other part, the double speak. Yes, the 2.45% of Malibu property tax that pays in here already provides for the full and equal services at the Malibu branch as all other branches. So we are fully entitled to whatever streaming service or digital collection that the county has. That's why we opted to stay with the county system. And it's a two-way street. So the, this profligate spending that's been going on and gifting money to Pico Rivera and San Fernando and other cities far away that should be funding their own libraries and they don't need to turn the Wi-Fi off. It'll work through the windows. You can sit outside and do it just like you could do it in Calabasas outside at their tables after the library's closed. So this perversion of interpretation of a legal agreement is inappropriate. And that is exactly why I emailed Los Angeles County Library and asked them who provides their legal services if they have it within their own department or if they use county council. And the answer came back is that they use county council. And I would suggest that Ms. Patrick start working with county council, who's going to have to answer for the same restriction of the gift of public funds on the county side as well to a private foundation. 
irrespective of the MOU, that the county, it says in the MOU, that the county and the city, all parties must obey state laws and ordinances, and they did not. Now, I would suggest everybody go to YouTube and watch Bill Cosby Chocolate Cake, and you'll see exactly the same perversion of interpretation of restricted use that occurs. And I'll tell you what just happened is mama came downstairs and saw the crap that was going down. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, followed by Marianne Riggins. Uh, thank you again. Um, I love our library. People there are really nice. I, I'm in that library at least once a week. I, I wish more people in Malibu were. But that does not alter the fact and the legal requirement that it's a gifting and they were taking our money and using it for other things that sounds very illegal to me. And let's just remember that we also spend our tax dollars supporting the 15 million visitors, mostly from LA County. Oh, we pay for most of the beach patrol. We pay extra money for sheriff protection. Why? Because we get 15 million visitors, mostly from LA County. We shoulder a tremendous amount for LA County and it looks like they were getting us for this one too. And uh, it now seems that uh, with that audit, they found their hand was caught in the cookie jar. So I do hope that uh, Steve will write the letter to uh, the supervisors demanding that that money be returned because it should never have gone out. If we choose to have programs, and I think it's certainly worthy of discussion, as Mikey said, to offer series, speaker surveys, education, further education, um, that we can open it to the county. I think that's a wonderful idea. Uh, frankly, I'd start with uh, getting one of the Pepperdine professors of economics to be able to explain that since nobody seems to understand economics or statistics but there's many many things we could offer and uh you know let's do it but through our own library thank you thank you scott our next speaker is marianne riggins hi marianne are you available i am thank you um I just have some questions reading through the report. There's some um, reference to monies given to the Boys and Girls Club, um, which I would say absolutely helps our residents with providing li library services and um, helps our students um, be introduced to books and other things. So if there could just be some clarification as to why those items were included in the report um, and the question about those funds being given because it would seem to me that those are helping Malibu students and thereby Malibu residents. Additionally, the questions regarding the speaker series, again, those are events that are cultural events that are put on um, in our community and benefit and introduce people to the love of books and actually speaking with the authors with regards to that. Uh, so if there could just be some clarification by the authors of this um, as to why they felt the need that those didn't in, um, fall underneath the MOU, uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Mary, that concludes public comment. Bruce, I see your hand raised. Yeah, so start off the discussion and I'll respond to Marianne's questions as well, as well as to other things. Um, first of all, I want to know, uh, I, I don't, I don't understand the point of Laura's invoking Jefferson Wagner as if just because Jefferson votes for something, it makes it right. Um, it doesn't. It's, it's either right or it's wrong without regard to who voted for something. Um, but it's kind of like a shibboleth, you know. Oh, Jefferson voted for it, so it must be okay. Um, you know, 
people make decisions that are good morally for wrong reasons all the time. And it may well be morally appropriate and, 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 and a good thing to do and a right thing to do, not in a legal sense, for Malibu to contribute funds to the county to less fortunate um, municipalities. Uh, but that's not the way our law works, especially when it comes to the funds that we're talking about right now. We've got a legal document that was carefully negotiated, again, as the quid pro quo for Malibu otherwise withdrawing from the county library system. And it mandates, not it doesn't, it doesn't say as the county librarian suggested that the funds should be spent in Malibu. It mandates that the funds be spent solely in Malibu for the Malibu branch. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether we think there are nicer, better uses for those funds than in Malibu, they're to be spent in Malibu. And it certainly doesn't matter whether the county thinks that they're better uses, they have no right to spend them outside of Malibu. Um, so yes, there are other, and, and, and by the way, the county of Los Angeles, or Los Angeles County, has a larger budget than most countries on the face of this earth. It's got a larger budget than most states in this country. And it takes, as I said before, 93% of our tax dollars. Uh, if we kept our tax dollars, we'd be one of the wealthiest cities around, but we don't get to keep them. So even though people think we're a very wealthy city, we're not. We've got, we're, a, we're a very modest city with a lot of wealthy residents. And our residents pay substantial tax dollars to the federal and state governments, and they pay substantial tax dollars to the county um, and we don't have very much of it ourselves. And this is one of those areas where we managed to find that we had an, a legal ability to get some of our money back. And then lo and behold, it's trickling out again. Um, there's never been any suggestion that there's anything wrong with spending money for the speaker series. That's exactly what the types of funds in the library fund are supposed to be spent for. So I don't know where that came from. I think that in the, re in the report that was identified as one of the appropriate expenditures of the funds. The Boys and Girls Club, you know, another example, unfortunately, of a appropriate decision made for the, you know, a, a wrong decision made for appropriate reasons. The MOU just does not cover the Boys and Girls Club. Um, it could, it could have been written that way. It could be it, with the county's approval rewritten that way, but it doesn't. But in any event, um, Steve and I haven't asked that that money be returned. We've only asked that the money that has been distributed countywide be returned, even though there's an equally legitimate legal argument that the money that was spent on the Boys and Girls Club be returned. And by the way, even if we asked that that money be returned, it wouldn't be returned by the Boys and Girls Club. It would be returned by the county. So we'd actually get a double benefit. The county would have given them the money to use and the money would still come back into the city's, into the funds coffers because it was improperly spent. Now, there was also, statements, I think it was given by Laura, about, well, the city participated in these discussions, or the, I think, or the county librarian, maybe they both said that. Well, you know, that's true. But basically what we have here is we have a trust fund. We're the beneficiary of the trust fund, and the county is the trustee of the trust fund. We can say whatever we want. At the end of the day, the county is legally responsible for ensuring that the funds in the trust fund are spent in accordance with its legal terms. Um, what happened here, and this is why there's discussion of the Boys and Girls Club, what happened here is the city admirably wanted to find a way to spend some money in the fund to benefit the city's students through the Boys and Girls Club, an admirable effort. And the county was like, oh, here's our chance. Okay, we'll, let, we'll approve that expenditure, which isn't really a permissible under the MOU. We'll approve that expenditure. But in exchange for that, we're also going to give ourselves a bunch of money. So the trustee says, yeah, beneficiary, fine. You want something? We'll let you have it. But we're going to take something for ourselves. That's not permissible. And when it first happened, the money that went to the Boys and Girls Club was in the neighborhood of $100,000. And the money the county trickled off, skimmed off the top, was $25,000. So no one really complained. seemed like a good deal for the students, for the children in Malibu. We get $100,000 that we don't have to take out of the general fund, so it can go to the Boys and Girls Club for good reasons, stays in the city, even though it's not the library. County's only taking, they're charging us 25% for that. Okay, 
fine. It was wrong, but fine. Well, the next year, it got a little less, the balance went a little closer, and then eventually $1.5 million had been taken out for the benefit of the county, and the Boys and Girls Club got something they had about $400,000, $500,000. I think eight hundred dollars was approved, but a number of those approvals were not spent. So over the years, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $500,000. Compared to the $1.5 million for the county, and actually if we had approved the $500,000, it would have been $2 million for the county. So that's what's going on here is there may be very good moral reasons, and if we had a vote on whether to make a contribution out of our own funds to other places, I don't know how that vote would go. I actually suspect we wouldn't vote to do it. But we have a legal document. The legal document prohibits the expenditure of our tax dollars that are allocated to the library outside of Malibu, and yet that's exactly what's happened. So the, the motion is to direct the city manager to write to the county I guess in the first instance request, we can talk about demand later, but request the return of the $1.5 million or whatever the exact line item number is that's been misappropriated from the county, from the, from the Malibu Library Fund. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, may I speak? Uh, I was actually at city council meetings when all this happened and at city council meetings when uh, we learned for the first time that uh, that there was a problem. This We became aware of the problem when the county was having difficulties and they started cutting library hours. And they were cutting our hours because they were cutting everybody else's hours. and people went, wait a minute, you're getting, you know, our, our money is, our tax is, is supposed to be supporting that. And we were very fortunate at that time to have a, on the city council, a very talented person who was able to establish, wait a minute, that's not right. And the result of that, which you've correctly said, was the threat to withdraw from the library system and a memorandum of understanding, which I always understood to be that, hey, we shouldn't have used your money without your approval, and we're gonna start spending your money on your place. But, you know, it was always open, apparently, to other people in the city of Malibu, the city council, coming to agreements on a year-by-year -year basis. And that's the way it was treated. And at, at each one of these times when money was appropriated, the attorney for the city of Malibu weighed in and the, the, uh, the county's attorney signed off on it too. And our, our representatives at that time, in good faith, made a decision to do something to get a benefit for the city of Malibu now, instead of waiting for another uh, another library to be built in the future. I can't imagine that going to a judge and asking for the money to be returned is gonna work. I, I, you, you have all these agreements since once we discovered the misappropriation and it was corrected, were freely entered into by the county and the city and nobody can claim that they weren't aware of what was going on if you go back and watch any of the, of the meetings where that occurred. So I'm, I'm not with you on this vote. So I'm going to pass it over to Mikey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think it's more than fair for city councils to make decisions from here going forward, but to claw back on past city councils who weighed in on these issues before I was around, before any of us around, to me, um, is is just a poor path. And I, I concur with what Paul said. It we weren't here to make those decisions, or in most cases, and it, 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 it's just, to me, it's a, it's a wild goose chase that makes no sense at all. If we want to make different decisions going forward, that's fine. So 
my motion would be to vote no on this item and I'll look for a second. Mr. Uring. Yeah, I just want to comment on the on the statement you made that said the the, the legal staff basically always weighed in uh, when these kind of grants were made. Uh, you know, the la we had the last meeting, all right, where they, the city council, the two city council people approved the five hundred thousand dollar grant. City, the city attorney never said a word. And if you go back and look at some of the prior meetings, you know, basically, the the city council the members who were not on the library subcommittee didn't necessarily read the MOU. I mean, I think they sort of took the advice from the library subcommittee as what they should do. And they, I think they expected the library subcommittee to have read the MOU and make sure we were keeping on the straight and narrow as we did that. Uh, the library subcommittee never said anything to the city council that says, you know, here's what the, here's what the MOU says, but here's what we're going to do. So, I, I don't think it was always as clear as you made it sound. Uh, and I don't ever recall the city attorney stepping up and saying, hey, this is the right thing to do. So that's just a little clarification there of what, what happened. I, I have a different memory, but well, it's okay. I, did Trevor weigh in when we did it this time? I ask don't him. have any idea ask if Trevor him. weighed ask in him. when you did it this time because I wasn't at the meeting. Ask him. He's here. Ask him. There he is. I don't think I was at this meeting. Who, who was the city attorney? Who was the attorney at the meeting? Was it John? I don't John, know. John. John Cotty was the city attorney when okay. this item was first considered. No one said a word. Okay. Bruce and then Mikey. So, um, first of all, nobody's suggesting we go to court, at least not at this moment. So I don't know what a judge has to do with anything. Um, and I have no doubt that the city council in making its prior recommendations did so in good faith, never suggested anything to the contrary. So I want to clear that up. Um, I also don't believe though, that they were given any legal advice, much less proper legal advice on this question. I think that these, these decisions were all made as a policy matter as to what the city council believed to be good and appropriate expenditures, not did they believe that they fell within the ambit of the MOU, which was negotiated by a different and approved by a different city council than was looking at these fiscal questions as they arose from year to year thereafter without returning to the legal question. Um, the MOU in section 13 is explicit that the decisions by the city council are advisory in nature and quote, nothing is intended to divest the county library or the county of Los Angeles of any authority to control or use set aside funds. So at the end of the day, all the city council does, this is the point of what I was saying with the prior motion, all the city council does is make recommendations to the county as to what they think are good expenditures. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the county's responsibility to follow the law, and it reserves the ultimate authority to make the right decisions, and it made the wrong decisions. And, Paul, you know, I, I don't think you were doing this in intentionally, but when you say, well, there's nothing wrong with the, with the council having made a decision to approve expenditures in Malibu, which, which I agree. They were, it was wrong, it wasn't lawful, but I, I get that it was an appropriate good thing to do. But they didn't do, they didn't understand that they didn't have to also at the same time approve countywide allocations, which don't in any way, shape, or form benefit Malibu and are contrary to the MOU. So, you know, if, if we're good, I, I see where the vote's going, it's going to be 2 2 draw, and that, that means it's not going to be approved. But, you know, if you're, you're, you're supporting, what is clearly a violation of a legal obligation on the part of the county that we that they that we gave a lot up a lot for, and it'll be what it'll be. And like I said, I'm going to bring back, and maybe Paul, you'll support me on this as we have our new city council going forward. I'm going to bring back a motion that we separate from the county and start using our money the right way here. So um, we seems like we have two motions and no seconds on either motion. That's the way I counted as well. So do you want to pass it over to Mikey or do you want to? I'm done. 
Mikey? Um, Mr. McClary, Mr. Russin, um, is it common practice when items come before the city council that they're reviewed? I mean, when, a, when an item comes forward, you guys look through it and decide, you know, if there's anything about it that should be told to the city council, correct? Yes, Council Member Pearson, that, that's correct. Um, I'll give a bit of a caveat here, and I don't mean to be elusive or slippery. Um, when it's a Council Member requested item, there is staff is limited to putting in just one hour of analysis, which pretty much gets us to preparing the, the cover report. Um, so if, if there's a green light at that point, uh, that would be the time that staff would do further analysis, depending on, you know, what the motion is and what the topic is. And then we would come back to council, generally speaking. So uh, thank you. So to the best of your knowledge, um, generally, um, Trevor, you've been around for a while. When an item comes to city council, like um, the last number of years um, for funds to be uh, allocated for the uh, to the library system or to the library foundation, is that reviewed in some way to make sure it makes sense legally? Sure. I mean, every the, the items are put together and analyzed by staff. You have a staff report, and then you know the city attorney's office generally. You know, looks through these items. In, in this case, you know, the operative phrase here is, you know, how it, the council interprets, you know, at the branch, you know, how, how broadly or narrowly you want to in, interpret that. So that's that's the issue here when you come down to this one. I'll uh, I'll make my motion again to vote no on this and see if I get a second. I'll second a motion. Okay. Can we call the issue, please? I sure, think we've Mike. all said our piece. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Council Member Pearson? No. I'm, I'm sorry, are you voting no to your own motion? <laughs> hmm, that's a good question. I'm voting no on this item, um, bringing it forward. So my motion was to vote no, so I'm voting yes on my motion to vote no. Thank you. Mayor Grisanti? That's confusing <laughs> as hell. Uh, <laughs> but maybe I'm just a little slow. So I'll vote yes on the motion, the motion to vote now. I Council almost Mary. feel like I'm the head of the coast, the, the head com coastal commissioner telling people to vote no on Malibu. Council Member Uring? No. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? No. Motion fails. Okay. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Do we need to take a roll on that? As the, as, as the chair, you, sorry, as the mayor, you can adjourn the meeting. I'll adjourn the meeting. Unless there's objection from. Thank you to the staff. Gets thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Hey, guys. All right. Take care. Bye. Good night.